With 0079, the first Gundam, we should now know why it mattered, what made it a success. We should know, at least originally, why we cared about Gundam. But more specifically, we now should have a good idea what was Gundam as well. So, for this, the first sequel series, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam from 1985, I want to pivot to something tighter and sharper as the key question. Is Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam a good sequel? Or more to the point, did this need to exist? I know it seems maybe a bit weird compared to why do we still care, but I feel it's just as strong a beam rifle bayonet to plunge into Zeta to see what it did. It's easy to forget in our modern era, one where multi-sequel franchises and settings which seemingly are never allowed to die endure. For fans, there's always the sense of familiarity and nostalgia, not wanting our childhood worlds to vanish from our collective pop culture, to have them like some kind of absurdly old cat for as long as we live, always, a bit dumbly, just happy that there is more X. Because hey, we liked X once, maybe. For companies, there's a financial incentive. When advertising can cost millions of dollars, established characters, worlds, and brands mean less money needed. You already know who the Ghostbusters are. Even if the corpse don't have an idea for why we should see their story again, we are getting one anyways. I feel this barrage has kind of eroded our critical thinking about these stories. But really, not that long ago, just 30 or 40 years, one human lifetime. This structure simply didn't exist the way it did today. Sure, you had your James Bonds, but each of those were basically a self-contained episodic entry with very little ongoing continuity. Even the Star Wars and Indiana Jones sequels were mainly based on the fact that those were inspired by serialized stories that did have multiple entries. As someone born myself and growing up in the early 2000s, after the creation of, by then, over a dozen Gundam OVA shows and so on, growing up with your X-Mans, your Lord of the Ringies, your Star Wars, your Spider-Man, and so on, it would have been easy for me, and there are many in my generation who do this, to do just that. Never really ask this question, is this a worthy sequel? Did this justify its creation? Or the most sharp and simple, did this need to exist? However, the reason I feel this is valid is because back, way back, way, way back. Tomino already asked these very questions himself and was skeptical of what he had tried to do. Tomino was interviewed for Bandai's B-Club magazine on November 30th, 1985, just four days after episode 37 of Zeta Gundam, Day of Dakar, arguably one of the strongest and most interesting episodes. Yet, what he had to say was, Tomino, Ultimately, because Zeta Gundam was preoccupied with the idea of the next Gundam, it became a strangely grown-up story. There are some parts that satisfy my own personal taste, but that doesn't mean it was fully accepted by the audience watching. After all, TV isn't supposed to be like that. In the end, over the course of one year, we were unable to do anything more than scrape away the sediment of old Gundam. Bandai Club Interviewer Up until now, there had never been a part 2 story where the former heroes reappeared in an older form. Tomino A work like that might sound interesting, but it actually isn't. I shouldn't say this, but since Zeta Gundam was a part 2 story of that type, you could call it a failure event. That's certainly not a good thing. But I'm grateful that they let me do something I wanted to try at least once. Huh, wow, that sounds pretty bad. You can really get the sense of Tomino's appraisal of the work as not being all that great. He makes it sound like back then it was an interesting thing to attempt, but not one that succeeded. But at the same time, even before production began, there was skepticism about just what a Gundam Part 2 story would entail. Another person who echoes this was Masuo Ueda, a producer on the 0079 films, and who, with later works, would end up being producer on Gundam Wing, 08 MS Team, and many other Gundam projects. In an interview from 2018 for the Great Mechanics G Magazine, Ueda recalls Zeta's production and this amazing quote which sums up what I'm trying to get at perfectly. After Mobile Suit Gundam, Sunrise's board of directors, director Yushiyuki Tamino and Mr. Yoshikazu Yasuhiku all declared that they'd never make another Gundam. They said they'd done all they could with it, so Gundam was sealed. We used to say that the day we make Gundam again is the day Sunrise goes under. So when Zeta Gundam started up, I thought we must be in trouble and that Sunrise was going bankrupt. The world was a very different place creatively. Anime focused on telling one distinct story, not an endless sprawling franchise. While later mecha works like Pat Labber would do so, mecha initially did not. While Gundam would become that in time, it wasn't initially. 
Zeta was the crossing of a threshold. Zeta was Gundam crossing that line. And before I go there today, I will now, as before, give a big thanks to folks who helped me with this one. Namely Morlock and Conan for getting me started and helping me with research, Demoria for the fantastic 3D model work, and especially massive thanks to Mark Simmons. His translation efforts of the decades worth of interviews on Zeta made this series possible, so a big, genuine thank you. As well, I didn't end up mentioning them last time, and I really should have, a big thanks to my patrons who helped make these videos possible. And a big thanks to Scuttlefish in particular for helping me get the funding needed. Speaking of which, if you like my work and want to help me justify the amount of life energy YouTube Psycho Frame sucks out of my new type ghost, then please consider pledging to my Patreon. It will be linked below. With all that out of the way, we can proceed. Today, I'm going to use the question, did Zeta need to exist? Did Gundam need a sequel? To talk about youth, talk about a time of confusion, rebellion, ladies, and a very angry blue-haired punk. In this transforming follow-up to 0079, until you see the tears of time, on Zeta Gundam. The most obvious thing to note about the period between 0079 and Zeta is that fundamentally, neither Tamino, nor Studio Sunrise, nor Anime directly sought to produce a Gundam Part 2 right away. Instead, Gundam helped create a wave of shows that, while borrowing many elements, were never exactly just another Gundam, let alone Gundam 2. Sure, many mecha shows would love to attain the success of Gundam, but obviously enough, that isn't the same as a direct sequel. In retrospect, it's funny exactly how many I always forgot, or never knew, just how many of these shows were created before Zeta became a thing. I can recall clearly my impression being that obviously, Tomino must have made Zeta in short order after 0079, then double Zeta and Shard's counterattack pretty quickly, following the success, with Dunbine and L-Game coming later on once he had finished that group. This of course is wrong. This is very much what a modern franchise would do in a heartbeat. Hell, some franchises are greenlit before even a single initial success even exists, mostly out of pure greed. When the reality was the opposite, Tomino and the others made a tidal wave of stuff in various creative efforts over several years before really ever coming back around to Gundam 2 as a project. Even for Tomino, it would take essentially two and a half shows and some five years of time for the seeds of a Gundam sequel to take root. For brevity's sake, I'm not going to review all these massive shows in depth here. Some deserve their own video, but mainly I want to do this as I've done before, to show the landscape, changes, and build-up between 0079 and Zeta, as a lot within Zeta is a direct byproduct of all these works. A good place to start, then, would be Space Runaway Ideon. It was Tomino's direct project after Gundam, and as I mentioned last time, was what he was working on while the Gundam films were in production. Ideon would air from May 8, 1980 to January 30, 1981. Ideon in general, in terms of mecha, is basically a lateral step from Gundam being more of a space exodus story in the spirit of Yamato, having only one gigantic protagonist mecha that absolutely dwarfs the Gundam in size. Tonally though, Ideon would also be notably, perhaps, one of, if not the darkest Tomino shows. In many ways, it's a bleak snowballing of distrust, anger, and violence. Many of these ideas were used previously by Gundam and would show up within Zeta, and much later in Victory Gundam. It would also inspire, many years later, the now colossally influential and popular Evangelion. One day, Ideon and Ava are getting their own videos, for sure. On the animation side, there are also some additional important notes. Itano, who would basically create his first missile circus with Ideon, and especially its movies, before working later on making it famous within something else we'll get to soon. But even within the character designs and direction, another new name to our story is worth mentioning, Tomonori Kogawa. Kogawa was someone who learned character design and animation at Tatsunoko Productions as a freelancer, working on such shows as Gachaman and Tekaman. Kogawa's very specific style is what made Ideon's characters stand out compared to 0079's and the designs of Yasuhiku. Kogawa took the line-heavy Tatsunoko style and further stylized it while reducing the line number, in this very specific way of easing the effort needed to animate without sacrificing the impression of a face. This will have a big impact later for Zeta. 
Before we fully move away from Ideon, there's a great interview from the accompanying Roman album, or guidebook, published that expresses the relationship Mobile Suit Gundam and Space Runaway Ideon had. Interviewer. I'm trying to listen to you talk about this, and it seems like you feel that Gundam films laid the foundation for Ideon. Tomino. That's absolutely correct. To peek behind the curtains at the film production process for Gundam, Ideon benefited immensely. Interviewer. So you're saying that it served as the impetus for being able to break out the really fantastical aspects of Ideon, which you knew would be a gamble. Tomino. Right. With that sort of mindset, we could have the Ideon gradually grow more and more powerful. I would have liked to surpass Gundam as a creative work while still being a commercial success. However, when we finally made up our minds to go for it, we ended up completely overextending ourselves financially. That's why the three Gundam films were made, to raise money so we could put Ideon out in the world. If the viewers, or other industry folks, or their staff on the project heard me say that, they'd probably be furious. But that's how I really feel. That's why I'm so grateful for Gundam, and it was a hit. If it hadn't been, I wouldn't have been able to do Ideon. Interviewer. No kidding. Because at the same time, the Gundam movie's adaptation, Ideon's film distribution hadn't been finalized. Tomino. That's right. That's how linked it was with the degree to which we, the staff, loved Ideon. We wanted people to see Ideon, even if it meant exploiting Gundam. This interview is great because it really expresses the kind of relationship Tomino had after making Gundam. He was very clearly very happy that it was a success. At the same time, Tomino was clearly motivated to capitalize on it, and to not directly just make a sequel, but to fund and expand his later creative works beyond Gundam. Beyond Gundam's creator as well, other folks at Sunrise would happily go through the creative door Gundam opened, to make their own projects in this new period. Ryosuke Takahashi would create and direct the October 1981 to March of 1983 series, Fang of the Sun Dugram. I bring up Dugram not because it itself was directly in line with Zeta's production in particular, but to help give the idea of the landscape of the time. Of course, Dugram had overlap considering it shared both staff and a parent company with Gundam. Even the overlap of Kunio Okawara, who did mechanical designs for Dugram and who did them on the original Gundam, furthered his style with more details of real-life machinery. Once again, another aspect I mention in my Kunio Okawara video for those interested. One thing that can be said they both share is a lot of youth in Rebellion. I will get into this later. For now, we move on to Tomino's next work. Now, as you probably remember from the first video, I made specific note of the Tomino cycle. Here's another great example. Coming off of Ideon, Tomino's bleakest work is Blue Gale Zabungle. Perhaps one of the most, if not just most generally fun and comedic works alongside King Gaynor. Even the name is kind of purposefully funny. The tone is staggeringly lighter and funnier than Ideon. Perhaps as much as the Human Bomb episode summed up how bleak Zambot 3 could be, the missile toss from Zabungle is its mirror opposite, and showing how wacky that show is in contrast. This is especially important to remember for not this, but mainly the following video subject. But another thing began with Zabungle, something you are already familiar with with Mecha or Gundam, and which started there and then became transferred to Zeta, the mid-show new Mecha. The series began with the titular Zabungle designed by Okawara, but at episode 26 they get the Walker Gallia, a design put forward by Kogawa, who was doing character designs. This pattern of a new machine halfway through the show would become a big deal as those familiar with Mecha know, and we'll soon see why. While we are on Zabungle, it would also be the first Tomino project where a young, up-and-coming Yutaka Izabuchi would do design work. He would be responsible for unifying the general design language. Izabuchi's style became very important as one of the strongest voices of the late 80s and 90s. His mechanical design and his impact will only increase across the decade and on further Gundam projects beyond the scope of this initial series. Generally though, Zabungle is more of a fond farewell by Tomino to the 70s robo-trend with a show acting almost as a parody of that time. As well, Zabunga will be the first step of Yasuhiro Imagawa's journey to one day working to create and direct Mobile Fighter G Gundam. And before that work, on several episodes of Zeta as an episode director, he would also storyboard both of Zeta's openings. Imagawa himself has a plethora of works I hope to one day do videos on, but for now, he mainly played a much smaller part and we need to get to something big. You see, something massive was about to happen. Something new. Something that could at least somewhat rival the success of Mobile Suit Gundam. Overlapping with the airings of Zabungle and Dugram from 1982. A work from an up-and-coming studio trying to make a name for itself. Macross is in many ways an ironic success. While it was made by Studio Nui in the wave of mecha shows after Gundam, what it really was wasn't really a sequel or successor to Gundam's ideas. 
It was in many ways a successor to what drew in many young people which Gundam would build off of, Space Battleship Yamato. Macross's other irony was in the studio itself, a company, as we went over last time, which had a science fiction focused approach. The irony here is that Macross would end up blending a whole world of elements, space opera, mecha, comedy, and maybe most notably, the new appeal of the golden age of idols, and an anime character as an idol to create its signature recipe. It was science fiction, but it was most certainly anime. It was a killer combo. This combo created a hell of a product that could seemingly appeal to everyone within anime fans. It's with good reason that, if Gundam would later be number one as far as long-running mecha franchises went, Macross put a pretty good effort to being number two. Perhaps in contrast here, we can really see just how much Macross was different from Gundam. While Macross had military elements, they were the military elements of its genetics of Yamato. Even then, the people making it were slightly younger, slightly newer in their voices. These young people were further from World War II in culture and time, and this comes through in the work. The sense of war in Macross is a long ways from Tomino's neo-realist World War II war film influences that had been in 0079. Indeed, even compared to Yamato, until its final act, Macross's war has just a very different character to it, and the use of Dekolcha. Macross really sidestepped and didn't really use a lot of the New Age, Space Age ideas of 0079's new types. Instead, Macross opted to use pop culture, the growing fandom, and the dominance of pop idols in particular. Well, it's true this was empowered by many of the same cultural forces. Forces like the proliferation of TV, mass media, and so on. I don't think it's really crazy to say that it doesn't engage with the same level of philosophy or conceptualism as the new type. An idol is a thing perfectly understandable and expressible as a fairly real and direct product. The economic bubble and boom of the 1980s in many ways further catapulted both idols, anime, and in Macross's case, anime with idols, in a big way. To mention perhaps the other big thing Macross transformed into its success was the mecha. Where mobile suits have traceable origins to Heinlein's Starship Troopers, the variable fighter is a different beast altogether. The real-life creation of variable geometry fighters like the F-14 created an inherently new cool concept, the shifting machine. Now here you could say, hey wait a minute Argonbolt, transforming robots existed before now. Zabungle so had them, Gundam uh, kind of had them, how was Macross different? The simple answer to that lies with a name that undoubtedly many know, Shoji Kawamori. Kawamori himself was someone who interned at Studio Nui basically right out of high school. Despite what many nerds have repeated for years, Kawamori was never a student of aeronautical engineering. He got instead an arts degree. Why? Because he was a big fan of Space Battleship Yamato, and then, you can probably guess, Gundam. It would be Macross's machines where Kawamori's passion for design came to life. The reason people say Kawamori must study planes lies pretty squarely in what made the variable fighter special what made the transformation stand out, and why it was a success. Kawamori's relative realism for the transformation. The inclusion of the VF's Vulcan cannon as a jet fighter gun pod. The use of thrust vectoring paddles on its engines to make up the feet of the machine. Even the way the missiles, wings, and body sections shift between forms. Kawamori took the relative realism of Gundam's mecha, then transformed it and pushed it further, setting the bar higher with Macross. Perhaps one last thing to touch on before we move on is obviously the fact that all of that would have been pointlessly a waste, were it not for the animation to bring it to life. As mentioned a short while ago, Macross would be the work that Itano's style really broke out with, and Kawamori himself spoke on it in an interview from 2019's Kawamori Expo exhibit. Interviewer. It can be felt in Macross. The first episode has so many circuses. It differs a lot from Gundam, which feels turn-based. We have one shot where the Gundam fires, then a counter shot with the enemies firing back, then another shot with the Gundam dodging. In Macross, all the action happens in a single shot, with many camera movements. What pushed the need for such an advanced and dynamic action? Kawamori. I was still very young, and at the time, I didn't know how production worked in an anime studio, how the action was produced. I promised myself never to do the same thing Gundam does. Gundam is produced with efficiency in mind, the production plans it that way. So on Macross, we try to do things the animators were told not to do on Gundam. Of course, Studio Nui itself would also make great use of the Gundam generation's new crop of enthusiastic fans. Many just as young, or younger, than the 23-year-old Kawamori in 1983. At the time, we were still students and great friends with Mikimoto and Hosono. We heard that there were very talented artists who were also SF fans in Osaka. 
We searched for them and asked them to come to work with us at the studio. We were astonished to find such talented artists who were approximately the same age as us. Nestled amongst this group was an equally very young 23-year-old Hideaki Anno, who would much later make the spiritual successor to Ideon in his now massively famous Neon Genesis Evangelion. Anno would return again in the fourth video in the series, as he plays an important role. So his intertwining with Gundam goes a lot deeper than what we can really get into right now. On the commercial side as well, this was what really pushed Bandai to have Gundam 2 have transforming machines. It was Macross. However, another work Kawamori would do designs for also contributed, Transformers. Kawamori created both the designs of the original Optimus Prime and a very variable fighter, Jetfire. This is interesting as during the development of Zeta, according to setting manager Shinji Takamatsu, Tomino had a video sent over to the studio as Transformers had not yet aired in Japan. Tomino was really impressed by the animation of the transformation sequences, saying, that's it, let's do this kind of instant transformation in Gundam as well. What I want to highlight with this is really the two important things. Firstly, as Gundam built off Yamato, new works, both within Sunrise and beyond, were building off of those to go even further. But equally important as well, many, many, many of the people who were making these works were themselves fans who were passionate to do so exactly because Yamato and then Gundam had so impassioned them in the first place. So, basically, Gundam 2, in whatever form it would take, would have to face competition and comparison, not just from the shadows of the cultural impact 0079 had left for itself, but now with the new and booming anime industry as well. With that, we can come to the last two original works Tomino made before Gundam 2, Aura Battler Dunbine and Heavy Metal L Game, and how they, in essence, dominoed the way for what it would become. To give you a sense of just how tight everything was here, Subungo would end in January 1983, then the very next month, Dunbine would begin. Dunbine would then run from February 83 to January 84. L-Game would then do pretty much the same running from February 84 to February 85, Zeta beginning on March 2nd of that year. So basically, Zeta would be the fourth mecha show to be created essentially back to back for Sunrise by Tomino. This shows some important stuff. Namely, that the pace of production on these projects was very fast and very consecutive. But also, it shows how the pre-production and initial phase of considerations for Zeta was done, as we will soon see, directly inside the production and creation of Dunbine and L-Game. According to the interviews from the 1994 Zeta Gundam Memorial Box Laserdisc, Tomino started the process of thinking about Gundam 2 here. About half a year before I started these memos, midway through the broadcast of Dunbine, around the autumn of 83, I anticipated that Gundam might be restarted as a business. Nobody had talked to me about it yet, but I began planning a new Gundam on my own initiative. I'd done Blue Gales of Bungle and Dunbine over two consecutive years. Considering the situation at that time, I thought Gundam might resurface, and that it would keep going indefinitely as a business. After doing two robot shows, I had a general idea what to do. So L-Game was pretty much a sacrificial throwaway before doing Gundam. Dunbine itself, as a show, is very uh, weird, to say the least. Its mechanical design would be primarily done by Kazutake Miyataka, the same designer who had made the Starship Troopers power armor Gundam's gun cannon was based on. Izabuchi would also then work as a touch-up and additional designer on the series as well. In addition to the returning staff, Dunbine would also make use of a more refined version of the mid-show upgrade in the form of the Billbine. You can see as well, a lot of the same root elements that were refined within Gundam make use here. Young people on a non-normal military ship rebelling initially against cruel cool leaders. It's not a huge stretch as well to see some elements like the complicated relationships, taking more of a spotlight, and to be a kind of headwind for what Zeta would entail. At one point in time, Dunbine has something like a five or six layer love triangle going on. At the same time, Dunbine is tonally all over the place and kind of a mess in the latter half. Character motivation is so often forgotten, or never really established, and the factions are numerous, but not very well fleshed out. Here Zeta much later would really improve directly on a lot of this, as we will touch on in future sections. I do personally think, much like how Zambot and Daitarn served as iterative practice runs, which then strengthened Mobile Suit Gundam. These projects, like Dunbine and L-Game, did likewise for what Zeta would become. It was right as Dunbine was wrapping up its admittedly pretty sloppy ending, that the motion for Zeta Gundam picked up for steam. From that same 1994 interview, which, by the way, was done by Hideaki Anno, told you who'd come up again, Anno. The planning of Zeta Gundam started a year before the broadcast, that is, around February of 84. 
That was around the final episode of Aura Battler Dunbine, and just before the first episode of Heavy Metal L Game, which began in March. The preparation started at a much earlier stage than the usual TV anime. Why was that? Tell me no. Zeta Gundam began directly after L Game, right? With L Game, we inserted a special episode to introduce the program, but we didn't have that with Zeta Gundam. There wasn't even a single week's gap. I can't believe we pulled it off. I've gotten old now, and I don't have the stamina and energy. It is here, around early to mid-1984, that Zeta's start really gets going. Now, a fun thing to highlight is this very simple question. Why is it called Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam? I know it's easy to look past in retrospect, and before doing the research, I even myself hadn't really considered what that meant. It's just a cool name, right? Initially, it was a twin series of proposals. They would take their names from the Greek names for the first and last letter, a bit confusingly, of the Roman alphabet. Alpha Gundam and Zeta Gundam. Alpha Gundam would be a prequel series set around UC 0045, and would focus on the story of the um, first ever earliest mobile suit, also confusingly called Gundam. This series would require some huge retcons to the established timeline, and would mainly focus on a factional earlier set of groups of Earth in the colonies. There's a lot of focus on the idea of a very overview effect concept, ultimately though, this was the weaker of the two. And as this was just a memo of an idea, it was a shotgun, messy blast of concepts. The second would take its name from the final letter of the Roman alphabet, Zeta Gundam, with the added title, Char's Counterattack. This would end up being the proposal which garnered more interest as an obvious follow-up to 0079. Okay, to be honest, the February 1984 Zeta memo outline is also kind of a huge mess. I mean, it's a proposal, right? But there are a few diamonds inside it for sure. The notion of Xeon remnants hiding with Maneva in the asteroid belt, the continuation of Char's character, and importantly, a transforming mobile suit. The success of Macross in particular was the emphasis for the transformation focus, and the protagonist's transforming suit. The 1984 proposal, really intentionally mentioning, the Zeta is also equipped with a feature that has been unsuccessful in the Gundam, called Wave Rider Mode. In this mode, the suit would transform into a form optimized for flight in an atmosphere with low air resistance, also improving the suit's gliding capability. Bandai was hungry for another huge Gundam-level success. At the 23rd Annual Plastic Model Trade Show in Shizuka on May 17, 1984, there was a bold title proclaiming Char's Counterattack. This may have been one of the earliest obvious public hints at the intent. However, most of the details are unrelated. All of this was further refined for the heavily revised Zeta Gundam proposal from July 1984. Just a few months later, much of what would become Zeta was heavily finalized by this point. Zeta Gundam is about Shar Aznabel, who has escaped from Al Baoku seven years prior to the beginning of the story. Upon escaping, he overcomes his differences with Amuro Rei, whose freedoms were severely limited by the Earth Federation, to raise a second generation of new types. What was once Side 7 is now called Green Oasis, and serves as the base and supply depot of the Titans. There, the Titans have completed the development of a new Gundam model, called the Zeta Gundam. A boy named Camille Bidan is one of the residents of Green Oasis. Those of you paying attention will note that July 84 was in the middle of L Game's production. So now would be a great time to touch on that and show how there are certainly parts of it that would pass on to Zeta. Perhaps an interesting and perfect focal point is Mamoru Nagano. As you remember from the end of the last video, Nagano and his partner, Maria Kawamura, were the ones who read Tomino's anime Shinseki Sengen declaration of a new anime century. Now, only a few years later, Nagano had become a mechanical designer working alongside its writer, Tomino. Because of the time frame, L Game would not just be the work where Nagano's designs first made a big impact, he was also given central stage as a designer, but it was also, also, where he became Tomino's conversation partner for working out the rough ideas that would go towards Zeta Gundam. From the same Zeta 1994 interview. The way I became involved with Zeta Gundam is very simple. During the planning in 84, I was the only person Mr. Tomino could freely use for design work. I was working as a mech designer on L Game at that point. Starting from before the story was completely finished, I was his advisor, or perhaps conversation partner as he refised the plan. Well, half of it was just idle chatter. At the time, as a director, he wanted to make a Gundam that would surprise everyone. He said he wanted to try making not just an anime-scale Gundam world, but one that wouldn't be out of place, for instance, if it came out of Hollywood. He didn't want to make a Gundam that looked like a Gundam, or mobile suits that looked like mobile suits. Nagano would go on to design several iconic machines within Zeta, but as we will get to later, Zeta's mechanical design involved a whole lot more and a whole lot many people's input. 
At the same time, from the Forbes interview from 2019, Nagano would be more melancholic about how much Zeta's production affected L-Game. Nagano. L-Game was obviously my debut animation. I really wanted to cherish it and treat it as something special. Luckily, L-Game was also awarded number one in a popularity contest in Animag. It was definitely a hit animation in 1985. While I was working on L-Game, towards the end, it was announced to me that the next project would be Zeta Gundam, directed by Tomino. Obviously, I heard about all of this before the public knew, and Tomino asked me to work on it. But at the same time, I was happy but quite frightened. This was a big project. Towards the end of L-Game, the staff were beginning to think more about Zeta Gundam, and in general, other staff were fading away from L-Game's production. As L-Game had been my first big project, I wanted to see it through with the full force of people. But I saw that the energy of the team was slowly shifting towards the preparation for Zeta Gundam. I also had to make new mobile suit designs, so I didn't have too much time to think about all this. But I felt a tinge of sadness at the time. This shifting and build-up would continue. However, one thing I do think it's important to focus on with Zeta before we finish up this section is the context of the focus in the staff. In the previous video, I showed a plethora of people who had worked on Tomino's previous projects. It would be very easy to assume Tomino did likewise again, that like last time, Ideon, Zabungle, Dunbine, and Elgame were the build-up to Zeta. However, this is both half true and half false. Tomino would bring people who had helped on those works, but not in the more senior roles they would have for Zeta. Additionally, New Blood was a big focus. Tomino's aim with Zeta was to bring in as many young and talented people as possible to the work. Many of the writers who would have Zeta be their first major Gundam work, or even first work with Tomino, were writers like Hiroshi Onogi, Miho Maruo, and with most of the screenplays coming from Yumiko Suzuki or Akinori Endo. These were mostly first-time credits. First-time producer as well, Kenji Uchida, someone who had some experience but never this position, said as much in a 2009 Zeta Gundam Handbook 4 interview. Interviewer. The episode directors, script writers, and animation staff for each episode were mostly young people in their 20s, right? Uchida. At an early stage, the request from director Tomino was, I'd like to work with young people. I want to prepare a new generation of staff. Since this was my first year as a producer, I thought I'd be able to work with the veterans who made the first Gundam, like Mr. Yoshikazu Yasuhiku, Mr. Kunio Okawara, and Mr. Hiroyuki Hoshiyama. So I was a little disappointed. However, the preceding works, Sunrise had been able to cultivate young episode directors like Mr. Yasuhiro Imagawa, all of whom who have now gone independent and become acclaimed directors, and new talents like Mr. Hiroyuki Kitazume, who also emerged. With them as a core, I then made my choices by relying on recommendations from reliable people, and working from instinct based on my own experience. Of this younger generation of staff, my impression was that many of them were actively intrigued by the idea of making a sequel to Gundam. First they had to meet Mr. Tomino's demands, which was a high bar, but they'd accumulated a certain amount of experience on previous works, and now they must have been exhilarated that they could take on the challenge of Gundam for themselves. Now I also don't want to give the impression that there was no carryover. Yasuhiko would do the primary character designs, Okawara would return to do some mechanical design, obviously Tomino would still mainly direct. But the difference this time was Yasuhiko wouldn't be working himself to the point of stress collapse on Zeta, doing episode corrections. Because now, there was a new generation there to do just that, as we will get to in the section on animation, one with some other unmistakable influences. As he mentions from the Memorial Box interview, because director Tomino was thinking further ahead about the future of the work, during a meeting we were told, as we move ahead with this work called Zeta Gundam, we'd like the old staff to give way to the new along the way. It seems director Tomino interpreted this to mean that we needed to replace the staff from the first Gundam, including himself, the new generation in order to extend the lifespan of Gundam as a work. Likewise, Okorara would not be doing even a fraction of the majority of the mechanical design work. A literal ocean of new designers would come to contribute, as we will get to in a section on just that, the mechanical design. So, with all that out of the way, you should now have a pretty solid idea of the 5-6 year buildup between 0079 and Zeta. The movement from 0079 to Zeta was a gradual one in interest over time, layered by multiple in-house and competing works in the media landscape. With that, we can now proceed to Zeta. We now know the time it was being made, and a bunch of folks who made it, and more to come in later sections. So we can return to our question, did Zeta expand the world of Gundam as Tomino hoped? Is Zeta a worthy sequel? And to the point, did Gundam need a sequel? Wait, who's that 
It's like a blue-haired kid running towards us. Wait, that kind of looks like that. It's that kid. It's the kid with the girl's name. But I thought it had gym practice. On March 2nd, 1985, the first episode of Zeta Gundam aired. The intro here is much less detailed and set up than 0079's. I think it was absolutely the right move. It's just an atmospheric tone setter. The world of Zeta Gundam must this time be absorbed through the story itself. Right away, the first episode highlights what really sets Zeta apart as a Gundam, and as a sequel to 0079. In the simplest possible, it is a rebellion against the status quo a subversion of 0079's setup. For this rebellion, we need someone to do just that. Who we need is Camille Bidan. We get a really fast-paced background on Camille this episode, as well as arguably the real inciting incident. As Carl from Aqua Teen Hunger Force once beautifully said, Camille took, took a minor, a minor altercation over his name, and then escalated it into full-on physical, physical violence. Physical violence. It is during all of this where we get the first hints that things are not right. The Earth Federation, having won the One Year War, now has a new group operating from within it, the Titans. Now maybe their black uniforms are just a callback to Neil Sedaka's 1976 album Stepping Out. Of course, Sedaka would make the original song Better Days Are Coming, which Tomino would personally approach him over, thus creating Zeta Gundam's opening, Zeta Transcending Time, for the show. Or... The Titans' black uniforms are there to indicate they were a quasi-fascist military junta who has usurped power within the Federation. You be the judge. Camille immediately has some big issues with authority. And even when given the opportunity to play nice, he once again escalates things to full-on physical violence and beats the shit out of the Titans officer who was interrogating him. I really want to gush about Camille, but I will hold off for a later section. While this is all playing out, a blonde guy who looks kind of just like Char and his two comrades in strange-looking mobile suits have been scouting out the colony, Green Noah 1, which is located at Side 7, the same where 0079 began. Similarly, the Federation is building a new Gundam there, okay, the Gundam Mark II. However, unlike in 0079, the exact enemy it was to fight is initially unknown to us. Who is Sh uh, Lieutenant Quattro working for? Wasn't Zeon defeated? Even their ship, despite sporting the colors of the white base, is now helping them attack the Federation? The answer is given to us in the next episode. Camille hijacks the Gundam Mark II after escaping amongst the chaos of the attack. It is here we see the second returning face, Bright Noah. Now seemingly demoted to a meager shuttle pilot, despite being the war hero captain of the white base. As Camille amazingly uses his Gundam to fire on the Titans officer who interrogated him, out of pure revenge and spite, God, I love you, Camille. Bright is later chastised and brutally beaten over his failure to stop the loss of the Gundam units. Here, we get a very blunt delivery of the new status quo. The Titans, despite being part of the Federation forces, are a group who sees themselves as both superior and unbeholden to the law, or any higher power. Initially formed to suppress the remnants of Zeon, they have gone completely out of control. And this, this is friggin' amazing. This easily makes Zeta Gundam, on premise alone, one of the most interesting science fiction sequels out there. It would have been all too easy to simply redo Federation vs. Zeon dichotomy, like many later Gundam works would do. It's what defined the popularity of the series. But Zeta instead subverts that wholesale. The Federation is the bad guys. To really put this in proper perspective for a moment, the Earth Federation is essentially a one-world government a super neoliberal future state that so much science fiction, especially in the 90s, especially in the West, saw as the ideal end goal of history. A government initially created by climate disaster that has now cemented its hold on the Earth sphere. There are no other states anymore, merely areas within the meta-state that is the Federation. Now this brings up the obvious thing. If the Federation goes bad by, you know, say, making a separate independent military unit, that means there's no means of oversight. After all, at the very least, should a modern nation screw up, there are other nations there to criticize them. 
Not that the UN is by any means a perfect system, it isn't, but even this relative speed bump of an issue is one the Federation doesn't have to deal with. Look no further than in Episode 3 of the series, In the Capsule. Partially, it's a small callback to Ditarn 3, but what it really shows is how brutal and unrepentant the Titans are. Basque, their leader, using Camille's mother as a hostage to sacrifice to wrestle back the lost Gundam Mark II units. It is during this that Emma Sheen, initially a Titan's officer, starts to see the scope of their evil and begins to falter. It is also during this where Jared Massa, one of the two main personal antagonists of Camille, is shown to be complicit. He can feel the evil of his actions in killing Camille's mother when the hostage situation breaks down, but not enough to stop it, he just kind of dismisses it. Here, Zeta is directly showing that Jared, despite now and later even exhibiting a slight new type sensory ability, is someone who deserves all that happens to him. He deserves it because he is complicit with the status quo, with the Titans and their brutal violent repression. So if you thought the United States was bad for doing stuff without any real consequences or repercussions, the Federation is now that a million times worse. This, in so many ways, is a really novel and interesting setup, it's kind of hard to emphasize it enough. In so many Western SF, the neoliberal end state is the good guys. It's the goal. In Star Trek, it wouldn't be until Deep Space Nine wrote the Métis in a more sympathetic light, some ten years later, that a Western work would approach this. But ultimately, Cisco and the Federation were portrayed as the less black and white, but still ideal status quo. While newer Trek has a bad Federation, you, oh you like that Argon Bolt? No, because New Trek is mostly written by fucking idiots. A bad government with no depth is just a cartoon villain. Other Western shows have tyrannical governments that form something like democratic states, but likewise their just level of depth is far less fleshed out, like Serenity, where we get this quasi-US-Chinese authoritarian government, but it's never really as well written or as direct as with Zeta. But what about the Star Wars? What, what, what about it? The closest thing I can say is Zeta and Empire Strikes Back, as the first big sequel, did a really good job. That's it. But what about Andor? Oh yeah, Andor's about as good as like, maybe like, some of the better Star Trek? But that's literally it. It's at best metaphorical and not set on or in the near future Earth. Star Wars is not a universe where global warming or neoliberalism can be serious issues. Also, for both of these good examples, take your friggin' pick of the ocean of fucking garbage politically illiterate Star Wars media. Come on guys, it's a space adventure setting first and foremost, what can you do? Even in their mobile suit designs, these things are communicated. The Titans use the Galbaldi and Hyzak, mobile suits which look like Xeon designs, but they were created by the remnants of Xeon's engineers joining Anaheim Electronics. If the Earth Federation is the UN gone wacky nightmare government, Anaheim here is Lockheed Boeing on crack, now having basically monopolized creating all mobile suits. In Episode 4, Camille's father, who engineered the Gundam Mark II, comments on the amazing designs of the Rick Diaz, showing that even within the military-industrial complex of the Federation, factions have formed. He is delivered back to the Argama with Camille after Emma defects and helps them escape, while stealing back the Gundam Mark II prototypes. The Argama, the ship of our protagonist, their suits, the Rick Diaz, and now the Gundam Mark II. Visually, in the mechanical design, we see a rebellion forming from within the now supposedly unified Earth Federation. Insofar as major science fiction franchises, I think it is objectively true that in As Space Settings Go, 0079's was already fairly unique. Zeta's then is even more unique in this approach. The protagonist faction embodies this completely. The Ayuk, the Anti-Earth Union Group, or using the other Japanese translation, the Anti-Earth United Government a force opposing the Federation. Of all the factions in Gundam, in direct comparison to the two evils of the stagnant neoliberal Federation and the blatantly militant and imperial Zeon of 0079, the Ayug stands apart as perhaps the most genuinely good of them all. The following arc slowly reveals more and more about just that. Camille's father, still loyal to the Federation and Titans, attempts to escape back Camille pursues him and basically sees him killed in battle. Jared and Camille clash. We also have Casfa- <laughs> Sorry, I mean Quattro, lecturing Camille through his heartbreak at losing both parents so soon that he should focus on making a better world. In Episode 6, we see the Titans introducing new officers from the Federation. They get better benefits and pay, endearing their soldiers to their regime. The Titans' forces pursue and attempt to halt the Ayug's operation, but fail. The biggest disturbing truth of all comes in Episode 7. 
Quattro takes Camille and Emma to Colony 30 of Side 1. After the One-Year War, this colony and its space-noid inhabitants protested the Federation's, still unequal, political control over those who live in space. They protested the fact the Federation used its resources and focused them on the elite who still live on Earth, which has barely recovered. In response, the Titans, deciding it was easier, suppressed the entire colony with poison gas, killing the millions of inhabitants instead. There's some pretty brutal imagery in here, of the mummified corpses of the colony's inhabitants, dead women, men, even children, blowing around the dried colony interior. The dialogue here speaks further. Emma asks how they could ever react so brutally. The answer is also tied into the Federation's fears, that those living in space were becoming new types. New types who would destabilize their status quo. Colony 30 was purged of these undesirables. It is from this event to Colony 30 that the AU militarized. Trying to peacefully reform the corrupt Federation was clearly not working. Millions had paid the price of this patient approach. Combat and action were needed. This is the core of Zeta Gundam's setup and world. A corrupt Federation status quo enabling cruel titans and forcers, and the underdog resistance of the AU opposing them. It really is kind of hard for me not to say how good of a setup this is. Not just on its own, but coming off of 0079 in particular. It is with sublime irony that the closest Western televised science fiction has gotten to this, The Expanse, had a similarly one-world government in its United Nations of Earth faction. Only here, even where the greed of the faction and its expansion into space so clearly created the 1800s company town misery of the Belters' living conditions, the Cold War with Mars, and so on, the show comparatively never has the balls to actually say, hey, maybe this fundamentally broken system should be changed, even when it's so clearly the cause of the problems. Once the extremist Belter faction pops up, and the Stargates pop up, the Expanse has no interest in attacking this concept or disturbing the status quo. But it is, after all, another product of the West. It is really that case where Western science fiction can sooner imagine Marxist revolutions on Mars than a change to our seemingly omnipresent status quo on Earth. Or, as Zizek once put it, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Zeta here, at least, is willing to try. Episode 7 then ends with the first of many of Jared's lovers, friends, anything that Camille ices. Jared Rush, the end of Jared's blind loyalty to the Titans kind of squarely bringing down this on his stupid ass. Camille did accomplish this via his new type potential and is rewarded by the Argama crew with praise. Episode 8 then transitions us to the moon. We get some great lunar mobile suit battles here, as with the suits boosting around on the lunar surface. As well, we get the first hints that Axis, the ghost of Xeon, is on its way both in space and in plot to enter our story. We see our first meeting of the Ayug's upper leaders in the back of a Burger King. I love the haziness of this room and the packed ashtrays filled with cigarettes. It really gives the atmosphere of a long discussion. The debate is whether to attack Grips 2, one of the Titan's space strongholds, or Jaburo, the military headquarters of the Federation. Quattro says Grip should be the focus, that any battles on the Earth would pollute it and be hypocritical to the Ayug's ideals. Wang Li and the other Ayug think that a direct strike on Jaburo would win public opinion and show the world the Ayug's commitment. In the end, Jaburo is selected. Episode 9 sees Rekoa, who launched during the chaotic battle of Episode 6, arrive outside Jaburo and meet up with James Kai Indiana Sheedon Bard another returning face from 0079's cast, which is definitely what the episode title, A New Bond, is referring to. On the moon, the Argama has reached Granada and is touring the factory where the new AU battleship is being built. Quadrznabl says he is surprised at how it was built on donations alone. Wang Li uses uh, basically my comparison from the first video about how America was once a rising power Europe didn't take seriously. That history, that of the Earth, and of the Space Noids, and before, has a way of repeating itself. Wang Li also kicks the ever-loving crap out of Camille. This is, um, to teach him a lesson? I'm kind of split here between Wang Li just wanted to let off some steam, or, you know, he wanted to punish him for being an arrogant adolescent. And, you know, as one of the leaders of a resistance faction battling a genocidal fascist military state, didn't feel he had the time to properly counsel Camille on how he should be a good pilot and not be late. 
Knowing they need more forces for the assault on Jabiro, Camille and the Ayuk strike team do a blitz attack on the Titan ships in the lunar docks. At the same time, the Titans try to ambush the Argama in its port. Camille senses this. It's during this Ayuk attack that Camille, our Gundam protagonist, is nervous but quickly helps gun down Federation soldiers. This is kind of amazing. In all of UC, it would not be really until the recent Hathaway movie that you would return to a main character, not, not disobeying, but attacking the Federation alongside a faction who are in the right to do so. Now maybe Judao and Double Zeta blows up a Federation barracks and I just don't remember, but I'm fairly certain Camille was the first real big case of this. Oh, oh, and what's that? What's that you hear? Oh, in the background of Zeta. Now's as good a time as ever, that's right, the bitchin' soundtrack. Composed by Shideki Sagusa, the Zeta Gundam OST, to me, easily ranks up there with some of the best in Gundam, and in Tomino's works. Now, 0079 had some good funky 70s tracks, but there was a lot that's mostly forgettable. Ideon really marks the first amazing soundtrack in a Tomino work, one of the earliest examples of an all-encompassing 10 out of 10 OST for a mecha show. Zeta, in contrast to Ideon's orchestral funk, and the very strong later Turn A Yoko Kano work, lands with a great jazz fusion bass guitar focus in the middle. While Dunbine and Elgame had strong individual tracks, Zeta, like Ideon, has a fantastic group of music to pull from. Saigusa would return to do music on Shars Counterattack much later. With that great music playing, we move forward to Episode 10, Reunion. Here we see already, a mere 10 episodes in, mobile suit changes are taking place. Anaheim's Lunar Factories are supplying the Aug with the Nemo, a successor to the GM, while the Titans get the Marasai with more Xeon influences. Shar gets the Hyakushiki. It is during this episode that the two big, big things happen. After the clashes and escape of the Argama, Bright Noah's shuttle is caught damaged in space. It is damaged by Paptimus, the echo of the fourth and final faction who will enter our story later on as well the Jupiter Energy Fleet. After being saved, Bright almost all too easily falls in with the Ayug. After all, why would he be loyal to the Federation who treated him so poorly? His only concern is his wife Mirai and children who are living in Jabiro, now potentially becoming hostages of the Titans, especially with the upcoming attack. He has a great little interaction here with Quatru Daikun, where he addresses him as Captain, his one-year war rank, despite being told, I'm a lieutenant. Another person in the shuttle is Fa Yuri. Camille's childhood friend and neighbor from Green Noah. Unfortunately for her, her family has been taken hostage out of connection with Camille. Their force assembled, Episode 11 sees the Ayug move to begin their operation to attack Jabiro. The insurgent rebel units will attempt to assault the heart of the Federation. One big thing this arc highlights, in general, is Camille and Emma's, later Fa's, motivation and involvement with the Ayug. Not entirely unlike the White Base crew in 0079, these young people are faced with a cruel and supreme government power. When faced with its crimes, albeit with some hesitation, they come around to believing in the cause of the Ayug. What is important here on top is the subtle differences though. There is no massive war, per se. While conflict came to their lives, what is motivating them beyond what the White Base crew did is that same cause. Beyond 0079, Zeta has something inside it. It has an ideology. Not just a message converted through characters, but rhetoric and a philosophy. Amuro and Frau kept fighting because the white base was basically all the family they had and the war would not wait. The one year war was massive and brutal, but they had to survive. However, Camille and Fa joined the Argama because under it all, they know the Ayug is the just cause. It is within this context, this chaos, that their chaotic adolescence will bloom into adulthood. Now, I don't know about you, but as someone who has lived my whole life, childhood, adolescence, teenage years, and adulthood under the neoliberal end of history, including its climate change, the wars in the Middle East, unbridled megacorp greed, and so on, I think it's kind of amazingly fucking appealing as a setup, and a unique one at that. I know how it feels to exist in an age bound up in gross stagnancy, and with ever-increasing political tensions simmering under it all. I have lived it. The drop on Earth then commences. A chaotic version of the 0079 battle. A direct orbital assault down to Jabiro. Even with the Marasai's Camille with his reentry shell still outperformed. In a 
addition to the list, which takes us right into episode 12's Assault Landing. We see the whole bag full of classic mobile suit designs from the One Year War and MSV fight. The Ayuk forces handily overwhelm the fortress. Even with the excuse that the Titans are pulling out, it must have been quite a week in 1985 to tune in and see Jaburo, Fortress of the Earth Federation in 0079, fall just like that. The further reason why becomes obvious. The Titans had left the remaining Federation forces as bait, to lure the Ayug and then wipe them out with two massive buried nuclear bombs. Amidst the battle, Camille senses and finds Kai and Rekua, captured after they attempted to spy on Jaburo earlier. Another fun subversion has happened. The Argama, vehicle of the Ayug, and plot, has been left in orbit. Instead, the rest of this arc of the show will make use of the gigantic Garuda transport planes. Here the Ga, a symbol of Zeon in the original, and Garma, has been flipped to be the main base of the Earth arc of Zeta. The episode then ends climactically. The Ayug escapes, and Jaburo is vaporized behind them. Chargina's fears have come true. For a show focused on heavy environmentalism as a theme, do I even need to say that two multi-megaton bombs going off in the Amazon jungle is bad? That much should be obvious. They then meet with Hayato, who is flying a very specific plane! Remember this! Write it down in your copybooks now! And arrive at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After their Jaburo plans went up in smoke, the AU plans to launch some kind of forces back to orbit from there. Here we see Hayato get a note from Kai Shiden, the legendary He is a Shar moment. Now I think this is another funny thing fans often make fun of. Obviously, Quattro Brigina is not Quattro, it's Shar Asneville. That is to say, Castle Daikun from 0079. We can pick up on this in episode 1, as soon as we see a blonde guy in a Gundam sequel with a red mecha. Fans then poke fun at this, saying, oh, how could this obvious thing be a twist? But once again, that's not really the point. As early as the 1984 proposal, there was this question. Hypothetically speaking, what if we were to imagine a scenario where the entire human race has evolved into new types? How would they be living? Here, most of the characters who are meeting Shar are doing so for the first time. Even those veterans of the One Year War in White Base. Only Sela and Amaro met Shar face to face without his mask. Think of it this way, if you walked by two random French guys in a city, would you immediately know, oh, they were actually Daft Punk. The point is to highlight that. The Age of New Types. Where those One Year War vets sense Shar's true identity. Shar's sense of identity in Zeta is really his big personal character arc as well. Neither of these were built around it being a big twist that Quattro was Shar. We were always obviously told that. What's important is what that means. Karaba, the Earth cell of the Ayug, escapes Kennedy with the Titans hot on their tail. They manage to launch a bunch of their mobile suits and pilots back to space. We can then wrap up the section, waiting for the last big cool boy to show up. After being hinted at earlier in the series, Amuro Ray. Amuro has also been pretty much shafted by the Federation. Of course he has. Amuro is one of the most expressed new types. The Federation, and especially Titans, fear what this new group brings. Amuro's just kind of lucky that he hasn't been cut up like Akira. Of course, Amuro as well has been basically under house arrest for years at this point. However, there's a personal aspect to this as well. As Katz chastises him for, that Amuro has been complacent and comfortable in his walled-off, well-off life. It is later when Amuro finally decides Katz may be right, and proceeds to violently hijack an airplane to escape and join Karaba in the Ayug. It's here Katz tags along. Amuro, wicked Kawabunga style, rams the Asimar with his plane and leaps out. And amidst the wonderfully animated sunset that for the first time since the One Year War, Shar and Amuro meet face to face. Now this is a good place to focus and end for a really simple reason. Bring up your mental checklist of the main pilots and characters of 0079. Amuro, Shar, Hayato, Kai, Sela. Four out of five are now returning to the story to some degree or another, with Bright also having returned as well. Now, with that same list, how many are with the Titans and how many are with the Ayuk? Starting to see the picture? This is, without a doubt, one of the most interesting and cool aspects of Zeta as a Gundam sequel. All of our familiar faces, the ones who sadly had to fight one another in the war, are now united, Old Zeon and Federation, under the Ayug's just cause. Even Darth Vader didn't join the Rebels in Empire Strikes Back. This is the first reason Zeta works and justifies itself as a Gundam sequel. 1. By extending the setting of Gundam past the One Year War. 
by having the New Type Awakening trigger a social shift in civilization, Zeta set the stage for a new and interesting setting. The old status quo, emboldened by its absolute victory, has created a genuine force of terror in parallel to many real-life trends, the Titans. Against this, a new generation of youth in rebellion has risen up. Joining them are all the previous heroes who helped start this New Type era. Together, the fight of the Eiyu against the Titans helped create one of the most novel and compelling sequels in all of Gundam, and beyond that, TV science fiction. This is a hell of a strong start. It's a strong basis for any sequel, really. It didn't just repeat 0079. It pushed and went further with it, as Tomino himself said from the 1984 proposal outline. When writing the sequel, I pictured that the people who survived the events of the wars would be leading difficult lives. Hypothetically speaking, what if we were to imagine a scenario where the entire human race has evolved into new types? How would they be living? What if we were to make a story that addressed a plot from this angle? I believe these questions are at the heart of the current plans to produce Zeta Gundam. The depiction of an era of chaos and stagnancy could be a mirror of our current state of affairs. Now, with that being said, I think focusing too much on them overshadows the real new central star. The mercurial, angry little blue-haired man. So let's talk about... Camille is a woman's name. Camille Claudel was a woman. To trace the origins, we must go back to the 1800s France, then still the cultural epicenter of Europe. Within French arts, there is sculpture, and within the titans of French sculpture, there's Auguste Rodin. Rodin historically became a monumental figure with his style. More natural, less romanticist, Rodin, like so many artists of the period, marked the shift away from the classical tradition towards normality. But within the body of the human works of Rodin, for the longest time, lay the neglected efforts of Camille Claudel. Claudel was a woman who worked in sculpture when such a thing was a traditional boys' club. Claudel herself showed just as much an amazing talent as Rodin. But because she was a woman, she faced a wall of discrimination and persecution for her passion. Her complicated role, then, as Rodin's model, apprentice, and lover did not help. Claudel's mother had wished her to be born a boy. Indeed, it was only with her father's wealth and Rodin's financial support that she'd had the freedom to pursue her arts. After her father passed and her relationship with Rodin ended, she faced numerous hardships. In the end, her mother and brother, likely combined with the pressure she had endured her whole life while trying to work in sculpture, while portraying natural forms and intimate acts, meant that she ended up in a mental institution one after another, dying in relative obscurity until many decades later when recognition for her talent grew. This was the relationship Yushiki Tomino wanted to tap into with Camille Bidan. The idea of someone facing hardship and living in the shadow of a bigger, more famous entity. As Tomino mentions from the 1994 Z Gundam Laserdisc box interview with Hideaki Anno. Tomino, I started getting serious around February of 84. The name Camille Bidan appeared in my memos around June, and by that point it was definitely serious. Discussion of the next project for the following year would happen around June or July. In order to firm up the plan by then, I had been searching for a name for the protagonist since the end of spring. I ended up with the name of Camille Claudel, an apprentice to the sculptor Rodin. When I learned about her personal history, I decided to use Camille as a man's name. In fact, everything about the character of Camille Claudel was transferred over to Camille Bidan. It was somewhat unfortunate for Zeta Gundam as a work, but I needed a character like Camille to bring back the feelings that had flown for me during L Game. Anno. There was later a film about Camille Claudel, but at the time nobody knew her name. She was a woman who spent half her life in a mental hospitals. Camille also has mental breakdowns. Was that influenced by Claudel? Tommy no. Of course it was. At the time, I instinctively used someone like Claudel as a model in reaction to L Game. But now I can explain it better. The position of her master Rodin in relation to Camille Claudel is also that of Zeta Gundam to Camille Bidan. I think that construction is the easiest to grasp. I know it may seem a bit abstract or conceptual, but I think this idea really shows the kind of stuff that writers try to use to frame a new character's background or approach. Camille came from this idea of surpassing Zeta Gundam. Of course, what Tomino means here is not just the literal mobile suit. Tomino is talking about Zeta Gundam as Gundam Part 2. To try to write the protagonist of a Part 2 of a major story, 
and the Camille Camille relationship of living in the shadow of that. Not just Gundam the Machine, but Gundam the massive popular franchise. And even further, and most character wise, Amuro Ray, the original protagonist. At so many times early on, when people see Camille and his ability to pilot mobile suits, they constantly compare him to Amuro, saying he is the second coming of Amuro Ray. But it is really in contrast between the two where the massive differences become so obvious. Amuro, despite his amazing skills, despite how natural a fighter he became, never really feels like a soldier. So much of the hesitation of Amuro in Zeta is born from this. Sure, he has grown complacent with his comfortable imprisonment, but he's also shown fear. Episode 15 and 16 show this off quite well. Char chastising his withdrawal and retreat from making something of his skills, asking if he doesn't want to return to space because he fears seeing the ghost of Lala once more. But beyond that, Camille and others sense Amuro's hesitation, his fear. It isn't until Beltorchica basically forces his hand with romance and motivates him that he can act. In such a stark contrast, Camille isn't just comfortable with violence. Once he moves past his initial nervousness, he's basically a born fighter. The chip on Camille's shoulder is what locks this in. During the moon arc, Camille is given a gun and just totally starts blasting Federation soldiers after a point. Even his initial motivation to pilot the Gundam highlights this. Camille comes easily to violence and in many ways is more of a soldier than Amuro in the purest sense. Which, you know, hey, if you have a borderline genocidal military parasite inside your one world government and you need a man of action now, Camille is perfect. The re-entry to Jaburo also highlights that. Camille pops the Titans' re-entry balloons, making them burn up. He shows regret at doing something so one-sided, but he doesn't stop doing it. The Titans deserve as much, and the running theme with Camille is someone questioning of the decisions, but the commitment to the action remains. This is in many ways the spirit of a fighter. Where Amuro seems totally overwhelmed by his new type abilities and sensations, withdrawing from the brutality he was forced into, Camille only grows throughout Zeta to embrace it more and more. From merely an angry little man to a believer in the cause. A true blue-haired resistance fighter. I have often seen some folks complain and say Camille is too unlikable or too angry, but cut the kid a break. He was already a misfit, already had issues with his parents, only to then watch his mother die at the hands of the police state government that his father tried actively to betray his own son for, who also ended up getting killed. Camille has every right to be fucking mad. Camille's family, Camille's world, is one of change and confusion, both as a teenager and as a human being. Now here, at last I can say, I love Camille. What? Why, why is that Argon Bolt? You want to give him a kissy kiss? No! The reason is much more direct. Out of all the Gundam protagonists, all the pilots, all the characters, I can confidently say Camille is no question the one, maybe more so when I was younger, that I directly was like. Let's go down the list to see what I mean. Camille checklist. Not tall, but not short. Check. Oh, yeah. Relationship with parents, not great. Dad issues. Check. Oh, yeah. Angry. Check. Oh, yeah. Horny teenager. Oh, Check. Yeah. Angry about being horny teenager. Oh, Check. Yeah. Introverted and withdrawn. Check. Oh, yeah. Extroverted and exuberant. Oh, yeah. Check. Weirdly super sensitive to others at times. Check. Oh, yeah. Frustrated with sensitivity to others, and so huge asshole to others as well at times. Oh, yeah. Check. Good with machines. Check. Oh, Massive yeah. chip on shoulder. Check. Oh, Very yeah. insecure about specific stuff. Oh, Check. Yeah. Weirdly overly arrogantly confident about other stuff. Check. Oh, yeah. Surrounded by girls with varying levels of emotional attraction. Oh, yeah. Check. Angry over confusion from dealing with girls with varying levels of emotional and physical attraction. Check. Oh, Capable yeah. of deep moments of genuine supreme comprehension of complex ideas and feelings. Oh, Check. Yeah. Sometimes goes into blind furious rage. Oh, yeah. Check. Also, my hair looked like his at one point. Uh, oh, check. Yeah. But it wasn't blue. Wow! Arkenbolt, isn't that like four or five massive contradictions? Does that mean you are also a weird little frick of a teenager? Oh hell yes. Now maybe it was the fact Tomino drew on Claudel, an artist, and I myself am an artist through and through, but for better or worse, I was Camille. I know that feel. Oh, so you also have autism. Okay, let's let's just get this one right out of the way right here. Let's just get out of the way. Despite Tomino mentioning writing Camille as an autistic child, I don't buy it. I don't think Tomino even began to come close to that. Pretty much all of Camille's social issues are explainable with his shitty parents and shitty world. Most of the rest of it is just him being an angry teenager. Take it from me personally, when you're just kind of vaguely weird as a kid, 
not one diagnosed with some explicit mental condition, and then people treat you badly, often, but not always, because you're kind of vaguely weird, it creates a positive feedback loop. You are weird because you are angry, and you are angry because you are weird. Oh, but he is autistic! Is, to me, a shitty cop-out. It doesn't really match up well with the real-world autistic people's behavior I've seen. So because of all that, when I first watched Zeta, I was basically around Camille's age. I related immensely to the emotional stress and struggle Camille went through. Also, I did fencing, and seeing mobile suits fight with beam sabers each week before they you know, me going to fencing class and dueling myself was totally fucking radical. Uh, oh, Argonpool, that means you are subjectively biased towards Camille. Your objective review point is totally null. How can you trust any- <laughs> Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's where Camille starts in a lot of ways, but Camille has a really meaty arc during Zeta. That's kind of why I'm doing this now, because the Earth arc brings up not just a good point of comparison with Amuro, but also shows just how much Camille starts to shift and grow beyond just being an angry young man. Episode 17, Hong Kong City, starts as a great example of this. The introduction of the cyber new type for Murasame. The Earthside Ayug forces of Karaba on their mega plane have fled North America and are heading to basically crush the Federation forces in their Papua New Guinea base. However, they stop at Hong Kong. Baltorchika says Amuro should pilot the Gundam Mark II. It's great, it's like Baltorchika is saying, of course the Gundam protagonist deserves the Gundam, but Camille tells her to basically get bent. Stop feeling sorry for Amuro. Meanwhile, Four and her massive mobile armor, the Psycho Gundam, join with the pursuing Titans. As the Karaba forces stop in Hong Kong City for supplies and support for their attack on New Guinea, Four assaults them. While she lays waste to Hong Kong City, Camille and Four's new type senses resonate. We get a full body new type flash. The battle ends inconclusively though. Here, Gundam is very bluntly setting up a parallel of Lala and Amuro in Four and Camille. The same concept of star-crossed lovers on opposing sides. Of course, as we soon see, the details, including Camille's, are not quite the same. It is during this episode we see another old familiar face, Mirai Yashima, now a full mother of her own. Mirai captured is an episode continuing this. The Titans have pulled some of their Gestap oh, sorry, special service officers. Their plan is to kidnap and hold hostage Mirai and her children. While this is happening, Camille and Four have their first real encounter. Four just sort of hops in, and Camille is like, Hey, Baby Palooza, all right. As they leave, both Camille and Four sarcastically remark on Amuro and Beltorchica as a couple, licking each other's wounds, which is pretty funny. As they drive, they share some banter, which kind of actually shows they're getting to know each other. It has this feeling of a real first date, which is funny when you remember Amuro and Lala, despite their overwhelming new type connection, never really had something like this. Amuro had that one moment on the porch in the rain, but beyond that, the amount of time in direct contact was hilariously limited. It is during this drive that Four comments on Camille's name, which for him is an obvious soft and sore spot. Four is kinda just playing with Camille, who maybe, just because of his irate seriousness, comes off as pretty endearing. She leans on his shoulder, and has that real kicker for anyone who has fallen in love. I was looking for someone, someone who understands me. Their intimacy is cut short by the worsening hostage situation. The Titans are ransoming the lives of Mirai and her children for the surrender of the Ayug forces. They decide to meet once more. Amuro tries to trade places and risks his life to free Mirai. Of course, the Titans double-cross their attempt because they're bastards. Camille does a SICK JUMP onto Base Jabber and leaps into action to free Mirai and Amuro. The Ayug will fake a surrender to give Camille time to take out the Titans' suits. Amuro saves the drowning Hathaway, Bright and Mirai's son, while Camille tears through the aquatic mobile suits. The Titans' attempt is foiled. And we end on one of the great series' moments. It seems at last, after several episodes of tension, that Camille has finally earned Amuro's respect. Amuro comments that Camille is nothing like him and that he has way more potential. Then we get this funny little shot. Amuro tries to shake Camille's hand, but Beltorchica is literally hanging off of him, so he has to shake Camille's hand with the other arm really awkwardly. A lot is being visually summed up here. Amuro is literally sandwiched between Beltorchica's overbearing romance and pressure to live up to his heroic status on one arm, and awkwardly accepting the talent and skill of the next generation in Camille with the other. This leads us to maybe one of the strongest emotional points within Zeta, Cinderella 4. Camille tries to put into words the overwhelming sensation of being with 4. It worries Amuro, who is clearly thinking of Lala's effect on him. 
Of course, Beltorchica interrupts their chat. Amaro ends with a warning. Mirai says what we've all been thinking. Chill out, Beltorchica. You can't just jump into Amaro's entire life like a human tapeworm. Camille asks basically the same question. Mirai basically lays it out. Lala has irreparably torn Amaro away from reality. Beyond his personal dislike of battle, it's just like Char said. Amaro is torn between his sadness of losing her and his fear she will still be out there in space. Of course, this is all setting up the main theme of the section. The question of Camille. Will Camille repeat Amaro's mistake with four? It's the kind of thing that only a sequel, only a good sequel, can do. Subject our next protagonist to the same hurdles, and in showing how they react, expose the deeper nature of their character. Meanwhile, the Titans have basically given up, and will destroy Hong Kong if it means taking out the Ayuk forces. Four meets with her Titans' contact, and begs for more time before returning. She says Midnight, which gives us the parallel to our episode title of Cinderella. Four and Camille go on an actual date of sorts. They talk about the obvious fact they're on opposing sides, they kiss. It's a very confused but sincere kind of romance. It's the romance of youth. They then talk of names. Four then shows basically the supreme tragedy of her background. Four is literally the fourth child in the experiment, and Murasame is just the name of the laboratory in which she was experimented on, to turn her into an artificial cyber new type. She has no memories of her past, she's an orphan of the One Year War. Camille tries to cheer her up, tries to say the past doesn't matter if you start making good memories from here on out. I personally always wondered if Faye Valentine in Cowboy Bebop was perhaps, in some way, inspired by Four. The notion of being haunted by a past you cannot access or know. Once again, they are interrupted by the war they exist inside of. The shot of the massive Titans plane bombarding Hong Kong always reminded me a little bit of Future Boy Conan's Gigants in its opening. As the Psycho Gundam attacks again, Four senses its approach and her personality changes as she is drawn to it. I feel like now is a good time as any to mention just how sad Four is, even compared to Lala Soon. Lala was used by Zeon, and the Elmith used her empathic new type potential for the evil of war. But at least Lala was a natural new type, someone who embraced the new perspective it brought on. With Four, she was artificially induced, not for better understanding, but to become a weapon, a tool of destruction. Lala didn't give up that optimism, even in death but Four essentially never had it to begin with. Her identity and her memories, if they even exist, are held ransom, and her machine, the Psycho Gundam, is like a parasitic god of destruction. Her headaches from the experiments, her lost past, her weaponization of the false new type. It is far, far more tragic than Lala in many ways. This is also showing of the supreme hypocrisy of the Federation in all this. On the one hand, the notion of spacenoid migrants that could become new types and usurp power, or is responded to with violent and genocidal suppression. But insofar as their use as weapons, the Federation is more than happy to hijack their evolution for war, as a tool they can control. Do I, do I even need to say the Federation is objectively evil in all this? The Titans even more so in aggravating things? Let me put it this way, if you're a Titan sympathetic Gundam fan, you need to seriously reconsider your political views. If I was Camille, and I was driving a car, and I hit you, it wouldn't be bad at all. As Camille and Four do battle, you can see the tumultuous personalities and their confusion overwhelm them. Four asks if Camille created just to make her suffer. You can really feel the pain she feels here. The emotions of meeting Camille clashing with her cyber new type indoctrination. Camille tries once more to get her to stop, but with tears she retreats. Camille cuts a Hyzak in half in rage at not stopping her. Mirai departs and she will be protected by the Ayug's contacts on Earth. Mirai says more stuff Beltorchica kinda shoulda known. It's best to take relationships slow and understand one another. Camille is forlorn. This arc then climaxes with episode 20, The Heated Escape. With the Ayug on the verge of assaulting the New Guinea Federation base, the Titans grow desperate, and will attack with all their remaining strength. Amuro, perhaps sensing that Camille has had an encounter like his with Lala, takes off into battle swiftly to make up for Camille. This worries Beltorchica. I love this second interaction because it says a lot about both Camille, Amaro, and Beltorchica in particular. She says as long as Camille is around, Amaro will try to surpass him, and this will get him killed. This is funny when Camille previously said Beltorchica's pity will drive Amaro to overdo it and suffer, that her selfishness will get him killed. 
What I love here is that Zeta is basically ambiguous. It never says exactly which is right. Real people's motivations and their emotions are not often so black and white, and neither are they here. Either way, what I love is that Camille basically says, it isn't my problem. Amaro's motivations are Amaro's, not Camille's fault. It shows a kind of internal strength and stubborn determination. This is critically important, as you will soon see why. Camille once more goes into battle. Once more he meets machine to machine, and then person to person with four. All at once, upon meeting, Camille just kind of dumps his emotional guts to four. He just up and tells her everything. All his hang-ups about his parents, his anger, his despair at his father's infidelity and his mother's ignorance, his feminine name, his pursuit of masculine accomplishment to push back on it, learning to fight, to fly, to pilot mobile suits. Camille starts crying. He says he doesn't know why he is still saying all this. Of course, I know why he is. As I've already mentioned, I was very much like Camille once. I said last time I had a personal Lala soon in my life. That in some ways was absolutely very true, but in others, it's kind of a lie. It wasn't really quite so pure. It would be more accurate to say I had a four Murasame. The reason Camille is saying all this is because when you have a chip on your shoulder, when you have felt the many cruelties of life be thrown your way, being misunderstood, frustration with parents, with people, with those who live dishonestly, and you yourself believe in things, not lightly, but passionately, sincerely, it takes a toll on you. It hangs onto you. You build up that edge, that anger like an armor. You learn how to wield it and you sharpen it. Sharpen it into an edge you can cut the world with in response. But like armor, like a blade, it weighs you down. It exhausts you. It drowns you in the emotional gravity that pulls your soul down with it. But when you meet someone, someone who you trust, but even more importantly, trust that you can be understood with, you can understand them. The armor, the edge, and the weight slips away. Finally, at last, it feels like you could jump 18 meters straight up. You don't always meet that person the right way, or the right time, or in the right place. But it does happen. Four asks Camille if he still hates his name. He says no. He accepts it. Camille has grown, has changed in meeting her. But he has not been torn from the world like Amuro. Camille has been emboldened by his anguish. Four decides she will risk it all to help him. The fanatical titans try to ram the Ayuk's transport with their own. Four crashes into it, and readies an escape booster with which Camille can get back to space. Amuro senses as much. Camille looks back one last time before blasting away. He turns back and asks, did I do the right thing for? He is asking the question, but he's already committed to the action. Bright then commands the Argama to go into a deep dive and pick up Camille and the Mark II, while Amaro is looked over by Beltorchica. This isn't the end of Camille's arc, it's very far from it. But Camille has faced and passed a severe test of his character. He has succeeded, or it could be said, Amaro, even Char, failed. He has felt love, felt the truth of being a new type, and has survived and grown stronger for it. Returning to that interview once more, Ana. In your comments at the time, you said that, to me, young people today all seem like Camille. Tomino. That's how I felt. In Rodin's day, there must have been plenty of people who became depressed, ended up in hospitals as it worsened. But in modern times, there are some people for whom that can become customary. In the same way, things that once felt abnormal have crept into our sense of the ordinary. I don't know if that's good or bad. I felt there were many boys like Camille. As an old man, I couldn't see that as a desirable phenomenon. I can say this because to me, this work has become part of the past. I was able to depict Camille's actions because at the time of Zeta Gundam, Japan was still in a dreamy state, the 1980s. People said, you can't have an ending like that in a robot show. And I could reply, yeah, I know, but that's why I did it. Shouldn't there be at least one work like that? As Camille rejoins the crew of the Argama in space, I can now say the second well-earned reason and character that Zeta got with its creation as a sequel. Two, by extending the characters of Gundam past the one-year war, by having the new type awakening trigger a personal shift in them, Zeta set the stage for a new and interesting character growth. Their struggles with who they were and who they are. Against this, a new protagonist of youth in rebellion has risen up. Camille Bidan, a reflection of the personal and mental hardships of a new generation. His strengths and weaknesses contrasting against Amaro Reyes. A chaotic soul born for chaotic times, who had to come to terms with both. 
in doing so, summoning the determination and belief to find the understanding needed, not just to survive, but to be the hero of such a world, a sequel, and story desperately needed. This brings us to episode 21. However, those who know, know something is coming. The shape of the mobile suit has changed, and so has its sign. With that, we move on. Let me ask you a simple question. How many people designed the mecha of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam? You probably have a guess. However, instead of dumping everything up front, I'm going to move through the middle of the show, bring up some big stuff about the mechanical design, how it changed, and then come back to this at the end. I'm sure there'll be quite a bit in here that surprises you, even those who may know a thing or two about Zeta. With episode 21, A Sign of Zeta, Camille fights once again in space. Jared and his new romantic interest pilot the strange beetle-like Gabfly. Camille and Emma are kinda on the ropes, until, sure enough, the titular machine makes its long-awaited debut, the Zeta Gundam's first real appearance. Of course, that's also not exactly true. The truth is we have already seen several designs which were initially proposals competing for the title spot as the Zeta Gundam, also including the silhouette hinted at in the opening. Char's suit, in particular, the Hyakushiki, is oddly detailed and unique. It's a very unsubtle hint that it was Mamoru Nagano's initial proposal for the Zeta. However, it was not selected, and as Nagano funnily says from the 94 memorial box, at that point, we hadn't heard anything about the story. All they told us was, please make us a lead mobile suit called Zeta Gundam. I decided there was no way mine was going to transform, no matter what. But the Zeta Gundam I submitted wasn't used. Later on, it was published in a modeling magazine under the name Epsi Gundam, and it became the model for the Hyakushiki. Another was the Psycho Gundam piloted by Four. This one was submitted by Katsushi Murakami. Murakami's name is not as well known, but he was the main designer for numerous Super Sentai megazords and character designs. It was pitched as originally being something that could transform into a space shuttle-like form, which is sort of retained in the final, but not really noticeable. Of course, we don't really get a full transformation from the Zeta until the following episode, the eyes of Shiroko. We get some solid character moments here, Camille is slowly returning to normal after his encounter with Four. Both Emma and Bright are kinda at a loss as to how they can deal with him. Also Bright, he eat Berg. It is during this arc when Paptimus in general shifts back heavily into the foreground as a major antagonist for the Argama, the Ayug, and Camille personally. Paptimus sends over two young female officers under the command of Jared. It is during their fight we finally get a fully, beautifully executed transformation sequence from the Zeta Gundam. And here is an excellent time to ask a tying question for this section. Who designed it? Now the rough concept of a transforming suit was already a priority early on, as I've said. Initially, Kunio Okawara began with a series of rough concepts. The idea of a suit which could transform into a flight mode and carry out attacks was good enough as an excuse. However, as Okawara mentions from the 94 memorial box, I think it was around the autumn of 84 that I was asked to participate in this work, but I wasn't the main designer. That's because director Tomino was thinking further ahead about the future of the work. During a meeting we were told, as we move ahead with this work called Zeta Gundam, we'd like the old staff to give way to the new. With this reminder that Zeta as a project was very focused on younger creators, we start to get the beginning of our answer from the same interview. Consequently, on Zeta Gundam, I merely handed over my work to a young Mr. Kazumi Fujita, who became the main mecha designer. I think the handover was completed with the Gundam Mark II. I drew a rough, saying, the Mark II is something like this, and then Mr. Fujita put it together for the final design. It's sometimes assumed the Zeta Gundam itself was my work, but that was an original by Mr. Fujita. At that time, Fujita was only 20 years old when he was given the responsibility of overseeing the primary design work. Now for perspective, the Hyakushiki, the Psycho Gundam, and many more designs were also basically finalized by Fujita. Fujita was given the massive task of essentially acting as the conductor for the huge symphony of designs Zeta would receive as a project. Okawara further elaborates. He contributes some other designs, but Fujita was the main coordinator, basically the one adjusting and trying to unify all the various styles with his cleanup. 
It was Fujita Zeta, which shows up in the opening initially as a silhouette, with a head design and detail done by Nagano, from Okawara in that same interview. Other than that, on Zeta Gundam, I was responsible for the transforming mobile suit Asimar, and an early draft of the Marasai, as well as Mr. Fujita. This work also included designs by various people, such as Nagano, Mr. Mika Akitaka, and Mr. Makoto Kobayashi. The times may have demanded that kind of trend. When you do a work as major as Gundam, it becomes too much for one individual to manage. If the audience wants to see a variety of mobile suits, you can't handle that unless you have enough designers on hand. My policy is that I myself am responsible for all the mecha in a single work. So it's probably good that I parted ways with Zeta Gundam. And that's the other big thing. Both Okawara and Nagano left the project midway through production. Nagano would return to contribute later stuff a bit, but Fujita really was the one who controlled and carried it all through. One final great excerpt from that interview says as much. I was very impressed with Mr. Fujita's talent. He has a good sense of putting together designs. Transforming mecha often prioritize functionality, with the design coming second. But he completes the design and then makes it transform. It's rare for a person who's good at drawing to be good at transformation too. It's a pity he left the front lines of anime after that. Camille ends up putting the Zeta to good use, and ends up getting... These episodes also introduce us to Fa's mobile suit, the Methus. Who designed the Methus? Um, Studio Visual Design. Or, or maybe it was Visual Design? Or Visual Design? With cleanup by Studio Kenmu. Now who were both of them? I, uh, I don't fully know. Makoto Kobayashi on Twitter mentions them in passing, I think, as a group Bandai headhunted to add even more designs to the show. I'm going to assume they both were at least a group of probably several people. Speaking of Makoto Kobayashi, who I did a whole video on here, he also contributed numerous designs. Kobayashi was the middle step between the initial Okawara Marasai and the final version reworked by, yep, you guessed it, Kazumi Fujita. The head area especially has a lot of his hallmarks. Later, the Bound Dock and Geo are the two main designs he would give to Zeta. With this, we move into the second lunar battle arc of Zeta. Paptimus strikes out directly at Von Braun, one of the Aeug's main bases and lunar cities of support. Fa's new role as a pilot is both interesting, but has its effects on her when she has to come to terms with the severity of combat. Oh, and Camille cleans his room without needing to watch a single freaking Jordan Peterson video. It is during these battles that we see the Gab Flea, and before now, I've seen the Gaplant. Both strange, transforming designs coming from Fujita. I think now, I'm finally brave enough to say it. I find transforming mobile suits to be really, really friggin' weird. I don't think I like them. Wow, ugh, ugh, wow, what? Oh man, what? Yeah, sorry. I don't hate them. Some of them are neat, but like, man, some of them are just kinda weird. Oh, oh, well, you're a pragmatist. You only like realistic machines, that's it. Nope. I do like me some Vigo. I enjoy a good Mazinger and a Geta Robo and a Die Buster or a Gun Buster. I don't need perfect realism. I can enjoy wacky stuff. It's more so mainly they're just like mechanically really, really weird. Artistically, I don't know, something like a Transformer or a Variable Fighter have a human mode. Okay, checks out. And they have a machine mode. Okay, checks out. And then, uh, maybe a Gerwalk mode, which is odd, but Zeta stuff is just so much that, but even more. Literally, it's it's like an Italian futurist designed these things. Just these abstract, weird collections of shapes, often evoking real machines, but becoming, like, insectoid or mechanical, or just, I don't know, uh, Ahem, um, Argivolt, it's done so that the thrusters line up so the craft can go faster, duh. It says so in my A Fat Steaming Load of Z Technical Bible 3rd Edition. Uh-huh. Or, you know, you could just use a thruster. The main thruster. Where all your thrust is coming from. You know, like a, like a real-life spacecraft. Or most of the rest of Gundam. A thruster with high enough mass flow, or just higher mass flow. To sum up why this is kind of absurd as an argument. Next time, instead of jogging, and, you know, building up leg muscles to go faster, transform all the muscles in your body into your legs, and then tell me how that goes. If that works, then you can say I'm wrong. For me, really, the Zeta Gundam is probably the best in both excuse and execution. The atmospheric entry and flight form both clicks in my brain, 
It also kind of looks pretty nice. No surprise considering the design of Zeta took somewhere around four months of proposals and revisions to finally become Fujita's transforming baby. Now here's another fun question. Why is the Zeta's transformed mode called the Wave Rider? I mean, it sounds friggin' cool, but like, what does that mean? Now, what if I told you the answer was already flown right in front of us an episode earlier? That's right, it was the machine Hayato Kobayashi made his entrance in, the XB-70. The North American Aviation XB-70 was supposed to be the next generation of super-duper insano-fast nuclear bombers for the US Air Force. The idea being, and going really high and really fast, it would be able to outrun Soviet surface-to-air missiles to hit targets inside Russia. In order to achieve this speed, it would use a number of features. The one relevant to us was its variable geometry wingtips. You see, by changing the shape of the plane, shockwaves generated by the front parts could be channeled backwards. These controlled shockwaves could be used to generate specific lift forces and reduce the drag, combining to increase the overall speed. That's right, in a simple sense, the plane could ride its shock waves. Hence we get, ta-da, the Wave Rider. Just like the F-14's real-life transforming wings helped inspire Macross's VF plane mechs, the XB-70s would inspire Zeta Gundam. Now the real-life XB-70 ended up being a failure for various reasons, and its name would go on to another mecha work, but those are both stories for other people in other days. Now, let's get back to Zeta, and its designers. Episode 24 takes us to Dakar for the first time. The first on-screen showing of the Federation civilian government in its capital city on Africa's west coast. The Titans assassinate Commodore Blex, there with Shar, essentially trying to fully and finally usurp the Federation's hegemony on legitimate force from the government. Both of these are bad things for the heroes and set up things to come. Meanwhile, the Ayug manages to drive the Titans out of Von Braun City. Because of this, Paptimus and the Titans escalate to an attempted colony drop on the moon, using one of the ruined Side 4 colonies left over from the One Year War. It's during this that Sarah, Paptimus' young pilot slash follower, is sent to the Argama as a decoy and double agent, there to confuse and add uncertainty to the Ayug's defensive strategy, to stop the colony drop. Sarah is kind of fascinating because, just as Paptimus manipulates her, she manipulates cats. This idea of characters in parallel is something Zeta and later Tomino works would make use of. Just as Camille is a kind of parallel to Amuro, as a point of comparison in their similarities and differences. Cats is basically that to Camille. Katz here is doing with Sarah somewhat like what Camille did with Four. Likewise, Katz's insistence on wanting to become a pilot is basically him wanting to do what he saw Amuro and Camille doing. However, it's tragic because he simply doesn't have the raw aptitude of Amuro or passionate focused drive of Camille. In the end, Emma manages to weave through the Titan's assault and activates one of the thrusters on the colony, shifting its orbit and preventing disaster. It harmlessly impacts 180 kilometers off target. This episode also features something pretty interesting, which is subtle, but I love. The first use of a base jabber, in so far as I've seen, a direct combat as a booster stage. Back in episode 21, Fa showed up with one to help deliver the Zeta, but this episode has it being used as a first stage to help Emma get into position. The use of drop tanks and boosters is something we don't really see a lot of in fiction, but we will see more of it in Zeta, and then in Char's counterattack, which is where I'll probably get back to it. I mentioned in the first video how 0079 created a working relative technical realism to sell its world. Here, Zeta has kept this up wonderfully. The heavy lift vehicles earlier in the series drew heavily on the then still new and impressive space shuttle, but also clearly take prompts from many NASA speculative designs for massive cargo rockets. Likewise, I adore the Argama for similar reasons. As the first successor to the white base, the addition of a long, extendable, rotating centrifuge for creating gravity is really cool. Its design is sleeker overall, and then, just as 0079 drew on 2001 A Space Odyssey, Zeta took some elements from the 1982 sequel, 2010 Odyssey 2. Specifically, the use of the Balut, an inflatable heat shield for atmospheric braking, which was used by the Alexei Leonov in that movie for an aerobraking orbit adjustment. I also love the re-entry shell Camille gets for the Jabiro operation. So as we can see, Zeta is very much keeping up the standard. Returning to where we left off, episode 26, brings the Ghost of Xeon. Now this episode animation-wise has some really fantastic highlights. 
some really impressive sequences of mobile suit combat in and around the ruined hull of an old Xeon battleship. Here I can tell you another thing that makes Zeta interesting and ties directly into this. Zeta was the first Gundam series, indeed the first mecha series and so far as I can tell, to have a mechanical animation director. What is that? Basically an episode animation director whose only job was the mobile suit sequences. That being Yorihisa Uchida. His role was to just keep the sequences on model, but also make them dynamic. Uchida worked on earlier Dunbine as a key animator, and would go on to work on Double Zeta, Shark's Counterattack, and many other series. The anime special collection, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam Guidebook from 1985, has a really good interview with Uchida. I want the viewer to gasp at the mecha scenes too. My job is basically to standardize the mecha across all the episodes. When I watch the broadcast, it feels like I keep saying, ugh, because I can see all the things I didn't completely fix. I think the studio mates I'm watching it with don't need to worry because they don't notice. But since I'm seeing it from the key art stage onwards, it's very painful for me when I notice something I wasn't able to fix. My favorite mecha are the things like the Hakushiki and Gaplant, which look good with sharp faces. I also like the Masala and the other transforming mecha because it's fun animating their overall bodies. Combat on the lunar surface was also tough. The dust the mobile suits kick up shouldn't really settle right away. But on the other hand, it would look weird if it kept drifting around forever. So we did it with the sense that it blows up dramatically for a few seconds, then settles down appropriately. The key animators worked really hard on it, and I think we were able to create an interesting sense of speed. This time, the quality of drawing is generally very high, and I feel the character animation won't collapse because the other animation directors are working so hard. However, I don't want people to say the characters are good, but the mecha isn't. Since they're working hard on the characters, I'd like the mecha to be well-balanced and interesting as well. In the end, the people watching are probably focusing on the character drama. But as they're watching, I want to do things that make them think today's mecha scenes were amazing too. It is really quite noticeable just how much Zeta's mobile suits and animation, in general, holds up. In comparison to 0079's often janky animation, I think even for the time it came out, Zeta was a standout as a work with some really solid quality. The perfect example for this, for me at least, has to be the vernier thrusters on the mobile suits. These tiny thrusters are called RCS, or Reaction Control Thrusters, on real-life spacecraft. They're used to control the orientation and direction it's pointing in space. Now I'd never noticed before, and I'd always thought Igloo, or perhaps Shars Counterattack with their higher budgets, were the earliest animated use of these on mobile suits. But, much to my recent surprise, it turns out already, as far back as Zeta, they took the time to animate these features on the machine. It's really kind of amazing. Izan makes his entrance over this arc. All of his mobile suits really showcase both transformation and these small details. In episode 26 in particular, he gets Jamaican blown away by baiting Emma into firing on the Titan ship. Now, Yazan is a weird character for sure, but I probably won't go too in-depth with him until Double Zeta's video. For now, Yazan transfers over to Paptimus's Dogos Gear battleship. It's funny because someone driven by ego like Yazan you would think would come into conflict with Paptimus but even Sarah notices they instantly develop a mutual respect. Yazan also mockingly refers to Sarah as nothing more than a battle doll serving under Paptimus. Bright gets a message from his wife and kids, and Camille and Fa generally make up. This then takes us to the Jupiter's infiltration. The Argama has retrieved and restored an old Gulgu from the Ghost of Zeon episode. Rekoa will use it to sneak on board Paptimus' ship, the Jupiter's, basically a giant fuel tanker that has come from Jupiter. Now is kind of a great time to mention something I really didn't notice until rewatching Zeta for this video. Namely, the implied development of mobile suits between 0079 and Zeta. Now when you have a totally fictional machine like a mobile suit, it's easy to kind of do anything. But one thing that impresses me a lot is the noted application of a historical design logic. For Zeta Gundam, we see this in how its mobile suits changed. At the start of the series, we see many suits which look like obvious successors to late One Year War designs the Galbaldi being visually an improved Gelgu, the Rick Diaz as a descendant of the Rickdom, and the Nemo for the GM, the Hyzak for the Zaku, and so on. But as the series continues, we start to get more and more strange and freaky designs like the Asimar, Gaplant, and Zeta itself. To me, this really works amazingly to convey a very true-to-life development lineage. After all, in real life, we didn't go straight from pea shooters and sop with camels to spitfires and mustangs. Development took time and effort. And counterintuitively, sometimes the newest machine isn't always the one that leaves the biggest impact. The Fairy Swordfish was a biplane torpedo bomber from the interworld war years, but for the British it famously carried out the Toronto Raid, 
and helped sink the Nazi battleship Bismarck in World War II, a war defined and dominated by monoplanes. Alternatively, the advances developed during a major war have a lot of carryover. The German Type 21 U-boat, while never produced in meaningful numbers in World War II, was so well designed you can trace multiple nations submarine design lineages back to it. Nagano has one part of the Memorial Box interview which I really think explains what I mean here. As I said before, during the planning in 84, I was the only person Mr. Tomino could freely use for design work. He didn't want to make a Gundam that looked like a Gundam, or mobile suits that looked like mobile suits. Along the way, the science writer Mr. Tadashi Nagase also joined us as a scientific research advisor. In our meetings with Mr. Nagase, the idea came up that, just as in real world wars, we might not see a lot of major advances in the world of mobile suits over seven years. Thus, for the time being, and also to reassure the sponsors, we decided to include mobile suits that looked like mobile suits. First of all, I designed mobile suits that served as successors to the Rick Doms and Galgoog that appeared in the first Gundam. These were the Rick Diaz and Galbaldi. After this, Mr. Okawara and a very capable newcomer named Mr. Kazumi Fujita joined us and began designing the Mark II and Hyzax. This is the kind of thing that Zeta was uniquely positioned to do as a sequel. Build on the world and setting of 0079 in new and interesting ways. Now I know by now you are all still wondering, okay, what about the mechanical designer's question you started with? Don't worry. We will lightning run through the last of this arc, and I can tell you. With Axis getting mentioned more and more frequently, almost all our factions are at play. The Titans, being unable to squash the Auk, have decided to basically resort to measures as severe as the Eons. They will gas another rebellious colony to suppress and try to intimidate the Space Noids into submitting to their rule. I find this interesting because it's obviously evil, but it's very different from Zeon in a big way. Whereas Zeon did so out of desperation to win its war, the Titans now have full Federation support. This method, to them, is just them being frustrated by the Aeug and Space Noid resistance. It's the One World Government's anti-guerrilla tactics, it's retaliatory. Even more than Zeon, the Aeug is basically vastly outnumbered and outmatched in raw manpower and money by the Titans. Once more, the Argamas crew foils, however, this attempt. We also get the first big use of dummy balloons, though I will touch more on those in the final video in this series. Where, likewise, the colony featured in this episode, Sweetwater, will become very, very relevant. Jared's Crisis then has, yep, no way, not again, Camille Ice is another one. Jared's Then, in Half Moon Low, the Titans stoop even lower, to an attempted bombing of the Von Braun City where the Argama is docked. Thankfully, Camille at least intervenes enough to avoid civilian casualties and get the Argama to escape. This episode also features the first on-screen appearance of the Hammurabi. This is one of the designs Nagano did when he briefly returned to do some more work on Zeta. This all finally builds up to the last episode in this arc, Unidentified Mobile Suits. Which is to say, Axis. The Xeon Asteroid Colony Forces, and said mobile suit, the Gaza Sea, a Kobayashi original design cleaned up and edited by Yoshinori Sayama. So we now finally have our four big factions. The Ayug, Titans, Paptimus and his Jupiter Energy Fleet forces, and now, Axis Neo Zeon. As I play some fine footage of the battles from that episode, I can now answer the question I posed at the start of this section. If you've been paying attention to the small Haro, you will have counted Kunio Okawara, Mamoru Nagano, Makoto Kobayashi, and Kazumi Fujita, plus Studio Kemu and Visual Design. Okay, so you think that makes, you know, at least six, maybe more in Studio Kemu and Visual Design, so maybe, maybe ten people. Wow, that's a lot. Well, hold on, because in addition to that, doing various designs, cleanup, that is to say editing, and contributing even more, we also have to add Kazuhisu Kondo, Mika Akitake, Hideo Okamoto, Koichi Ohata, Nobuyoshi Habara, Hiroki Hayashi, Yoshinori Sayama, Katsushi Murakami, Masahiro Oda, and at least several more uncredited modelers, designers, and artists. What this means is bare minimum, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam had, for its mechanical design, at least 15 to 20 to maybe even 30 people working on it at various stages and to various degrees. What this means, dear viewer, is, to the best of my knowledge, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam is the single largest work of fiction in terms of original design, mechanical designers, in human history. As Uchida mentions from the Memorial Box interview, at the time, the environment wasn't subdivided as it is now into main mecha, guest mecha, and props like vehicles and firearms each with their own specialized designers. In most cases, the rule was that a single designer would design virtually all the mecha for an individual series. 
and it was Mr. Okawara who handed this enormous task over during First Gundam. This time, however, Mr. Okawara wouldn't be completely responsible for the mechanical design, the way that Mr. Yasuhiku was for the character design. I began by searching for new mecha designers, and we ended up with the young Mr. Kazumi Fujita designing based on Okawara's plans. In a Gundam series, it's an absolute necessity to have lots of mobile suits appear throughout the story, and in Zeta Gundam, we also added the major concept of mobile suit transformation. Naturally, we were all getting requests for products from the sponsor, Bandai, so the burden of meeting all these demands would be too much for a single designer. As a result, we ended up having a variety of people participate. Battletech and MechWarrior, maybe, maybe, in that franchise's entire history since starting in 1984, in all its rulebooks, softcover novels, games combined, might have the same number of designers as Zeta did over just two to three years from 1983 to 85. But Argon, what about Transformers, Optimus Kidney Stone, Guangdong Hong Kong Jobs Program by Michael Bay? China will grow well, Okay, that might have a massive army of visual artists, but ultimately the actual design design phase is one done by a much smaller team of concept artists, most of which are, and I hope no one is surprised here, largely regurgitating an agreed upon aesthetic. You have tons of people, but you don't really have tons of new and creative designs. Sorry. Now obviously this does make Zeta's visual style a veritable shotgun blast of design language. It's oftentimes weird, packed to the gills, and very random in terms of the design decisions. Do you remember the Barzam? I don't remember the Barzam pretty often. Personally I, and I think most people, kind of prefer one or two main mechanical designers handling things. It keeps a honed in style. But good god do I have to applaud the effort. Like so much in the following sections, while the execution altogether is of varying quality, holy shit is it kind of impressive in its output. Scale and raw cojones at just attempting this. They got friggin' everyone they could to work on this project, and come up with something new instead of just phoning it in. Um, ahem, Argon, they didn't get Masamune Shiro. Well, actually, they tried to get him as well, but he was very busy teaching art. Um, uh, Izabuchi? Uh, first Gundam was Double Zeta later in 85, then Shark's Counterattack in War in the Pocket. Uh, uh, Yamashita? Um, not really active until Gunbuster in 88. Trust me, they reached out to everybody who could draw. Really, Nagano kinda summed it up great. I think the fun and interest of the mecha in Zeta Gundam comes from the fact that all the participating designers stood their ground with the conviction, I'm the greatest mobile suit artist. Maybe that's the reason they produce such unusual enthusiasm and popularity. So, number three, by extending the machines of Gundam past the one-year war, by ambition to capitalize on a new generation of mechanical designers, the transformation of the mobile suit was achieved with this freedom only a sequel could afford. Once again, Zeta held true to 0079's commitment to a relative realism born from real-life science, machines, and other science fiction, but also by focusing on the animated expression of the machine, with new strange forms and styles. Zeta set the stage for a new and interesting era of mecha. Still to this day, perhaps the single largest and most ambitious work in its creative output in the entire history of mecha. Of course, many iconic and amazing, Quebly and the O, and many friggin' weird, Bound Doc, designs are yet to come, but I feel I have given you a good perspective on the machines of Zeta, who made them and how they made them. So now it's time to focus the rest of this video, more and more, on Zeta's characters, and very importantly, its politics and its themes. The man who we know, and who now reveals to the world to be Shar Aznable, takes the podium. What he says is perhaps one of, if not the single most important moment within the themes and ideology ever presented within Mobile Suit Gundam. The Dakar Speech. From the appropriately named Day of Dakar. This single speech, and the arc leading up to it, encapsulates what I feel to be one of the high water marks of Gundam. One of those moments where Gundam isn't just a fun mecha science fiction show, but where it easily becomes something well beyond its western peers of Star Trek and Star Wars. I would be lying if I said figuring out how to unpack this single speech was easy. Earth is the cradle of humanity, but we must leave the cradle. We humans must not pollute the Earth. The Titans are those people who on Earth have their souls weighed down by gravity. It is perhaps one of the most blunt moments where Gundam, or Tamino, lays the political themes of the work bare, where they are no longer subtext, but are the explicit text of the work, of its characters. One of my good friends remarked in memory he found the speech a bit odd, that it focused so much on the environment and environmental themes. 
that it wasn't more radical for the space noids. But having rewatched it for this video and having spent a good while pondering the meaning, I think I have understood the intention, and can now explain why Char says what he says at Dakar. It's the kind of thing only Zeta, as a sequel, could say. In the simplest sense, the speech is really trying to say something. The connection between the changing essences of three main things. 1. Perspective. After the space race and of the environment, the world. 2. Human politics, governments, and history. And most importantly, 3. The people within the middle of these. It is vital, I feel, that you don't separate these things. They are all interwoven. So much so, it's hard for me to even know where to begin. I think it's best to pose one simple question that perfectly makes an entry. When was the first Earth Day? The day when people, all over the world, would celebrate a day just recognizing that, and the threat it faced. I know it seems a bit odd to consider, but think about it. It was April 22nd, 1970. Over 53 years ago, just a year after Apollo 11. The motivation was a number of factors. Big factors, really. On January 28, 1969, the Union Oil Platform accident released 3 million gallons of oil. The impact killed thousands of animals and polluted the waters off of California. Wisconsin Senator Nelson saw the event and wanted to take action. He hired a young activist named Dennis Hayes. Hayes would put together a team to organize that first event. It was supposed to be a teach-in, but grew instead to the point that 20 million Americans came out making it the single largest day-long protest in not just American, but human history. Since that first Earth Day, billions of people all over the world have participated. I don't believe the timing was a coincidence at all. Apollo, Earth Day, the proliferation of television, the Earth seen from space, from the moon, the destruction of the Earth seen on television. What happened? Why did so many people come out? I think, dear viewer, after the previous video, I know why. Earth Day 1970 was in essence a terrestrial mass overview effect event. Like the Apollo landing, it required so much technology and so much awareness to build. At the same time, it required people to lose the old customary idea that nature was immovable, untouchable, plentiful, and limitless. The reality of life, of living on Earth, of approaching the environment, of our impact finally changed something. It changed the customs, morals, and ideas of pre-modern history or in Japanese, the Fuzoku. It is then not really that odd at all that Zeta Gundam has the environmental focus. From the sadness at the destruction of the rainforest when Jaburo is destroyed in nuclear fire by the Titans, to the events of this arc, the battles of the Ayug against the Titans on Kilimanjaro, the focus on local wildlife being impacted, coming to a head with Dakar. Just as with Jaburo, it is fascinating that Gundam chose the capital of the Earth Federation not to be located in Geneva, like Star Trek, or New York, where the real United Nations sits. Not Paris or Tokyo, but Dakar, a mostly rural small city in Africa, on its western coast within the nation of Senegal. Dakar in 1985, and Dakar today, also sits on the border. The border of the expanding Sahara Desert. But really, on the border between the old fading perception of nature as unchanging, and the new grim spreading reality of climate change. Even now, Dakar and Senegal, despite its relative poverty, is trying to combat this rising threat. Tomino and Zeta placing the capital here is not a coincidence at all. The Federation is bluntly showing its ignorance. The desert is quite literally engulfing it, physically, but the politics of the age are slow to react, if at all. This is the obvious next point, really. Climate change, the climate crisis, is political. No two ways about it. This goes far back. One of the main reasons the first Earth Day succeeded was in no small part down to labor leader Walter Ruther, who motivated and got the International Union, United Automobile, Aerospace, and Agricultural Implement Workers of America, known more colloquially as the United Auto Workers, to mobilize its members to support it. Earth Day was, from the very beginning, political. I mentioned last video as well that we still live under the risk of falling back into history. That Xeon represented that risk but that as well we now live past that in the end of history. That since the fall of the Berlin Wall, now more than ever, humanity is stuck on this neoliberal world essentially with itself. When Axis shows up, Zeta is doing just that. The characters like Char scoff at the bad joke of Neo Zeon, a neo-nationalist movement orbiting the puppet child ruler of Mineva, Dozel's daughter, mainly controlled by the then even more manipulative Haman Karn. Zeta here firmly says no. 
A reactionary backswing to empire and monarchy, as Marx and Engels once wrote, is not a fucking option. Shah rebukes this again in his speech at Dakar, as the son of Daikun, who originated the ideas that Zeon hijacked, rejecting the reprisal or renewal of that failure, of that corruption of the potential of new types used to stoke a racist, fascist empire. But they did not win, they lost. This is really the other aspect of it. Why do we have a climate crisis? What has caused it? Humanity is unquestionably the scientifically proven answer, but even more so, the systemic answer is capitalism. What produces the vast quantities of climate change in greenhouse gases? It is the physical economic flesh of this system. Airplanes, cargo ships, cars, the buying and selling of goods, the release of energy to feed this system in coal and oil power plants, in the meat industry and its excess to feed us who enable it. But, but, but Argon, what, what about the RLC? What about the communists? What about it? The Soviets lost for the better of us all. The West won financially. The same financial victory causing our modern world and issues. This to me has only become more relevant. In a way, when I see Russian troops waving Soviet flags, I don't see leftists, I see basically Neo-Zeon. When I think of the USSR, I think of Zeon. A corruption of the ideas of Marx. A corruption of the ideas of Daikun. But as I have already said, and said again, we do not live in the world, thank God, where that regime won. What we live under is the world after the end of history. We live under the Federation. This is the staggering frustration of the times that we exist in. It's an anger I've felt personally. I know many of you out there have felt it as well. The Earth, the world we are living on, its life, is dying. The systems that kept civilization, humanity, everything going, are being pushed further and further. Recently, William Shatner, the actor who played Captain Kirk in the original Star Trek, was given a ticket to space by billionaire Jeff Bezos. The reason I mention this is because on that short trip, what he experienced was, in some ways, a perfect encapsulation of this whole idea. I saw a cold, dark, black emptiness. It was unlike any blackness you can see or feel on Earth. It was deep, enveloping, all-encompassing. I turned back towards the light of home. I could see the curvature of the Earth, the beige of the desert, the white of the clouds, and the blue of the sky. It was life. Nurturing, sustaining life. Mother Earth. Gaia. And I was leaving her. It was among the strongest feelings of grief I'd ever encountered. The contrast between the vicious coldness of space and the warm nurturing of Earth below filled me with overwhelming sadness. Every day we are confronted with the knowledge of further destruction of the Earth at our hands. The extinction of animal species, of flora and fauna. Things that took five billion years to evolve, and suddenly we will never see them again because of the interference of mankind. It filled me with dread. My trip to space was supposed to be a celebration. Instead, it felt like a funeral. I'm sure the fact the asshole Bezos funded the trip is also perfectly ironically to the point of what I was trying to say. And when we look for the cause, we are faced with this frustrating, aggravating reality. Our systems, our economics and politics are causing it. We get excuses. Isn't it great that at least the Nazis and the Soviets lost? Why should we disturb the status quo? The good guys won. We live in an age of plenty. Now tolerate our lethargic inaction and blatant abuses of power. Is it any surprise then that so many resort to reactionary anger? Following populist strongmen leaders. I hate those people, but it is the same. I can see why they are caused. What better an example than in Brasilia, the city last time I mentioned inspiring Jaburo? There recently were huge populist riots in support of Bolsonaro after he lost re-election. A man who very much physically embodies this negative populist reactionism perfectly, who made sure to deregulate and encourage even more deforestation of the Amazon. But Bolsonaro could only take power because of the people's frustration with the corruption of the Brazilian government in the first place. Our governments and economics caused this. It is the core of Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. Zeon, the problems of the Federation are caused by the Federation. As Tomino wrote in the proposal, the depiction of an era of chaos and stagnancy could be a mirror of our current state of affairs. This would be a time of overindulgence and starvation. This concept, I feel, relates back to something important. Something I brought up in my Revenge of Mecha series. The Mandate of Heaven. In ancient China, there was a belief. A belief that when the leaders were just, the gods would be happy. 
would bring rains and provide bounty for those who lived under their kings and generals. But when the leaders were evil, were corrupt or greedy, the gods would punish the world with a time of famine and disease, with droughts and floods. Then it would fall on the people to depose their evil rulers, who had lost this mandate of heaven. Of course, this is mythological, but I can't help but feel the same sentiment burns true, now more than ever, and even within Zeta. Because in the past, it was mismanagement which meant when bad times, caused by nature, came, that people suffered under their evil rulers. However, now, with climate change, it's even worse. Our leaders are actually, physically, enabling this. We humans are disturbing the mandate all by ourselves. The people we trust to lead us have, at the best of times, not done enough to help change society, and at the worst have denied the problem, aggravated it for personal gain and support. They have capitalized on our general frustration to enable their own destructive self-benefit. What we needed with the environment was decisive action 40 years ago when Zeta was airing. Thus, I hope you can now see these three things. The environment, the perspective of the world, people, and our history and politics are all knit together, as they are within Shar's speech. It is with our perspective that we can see the Earth, and the disaster befalling it, see all of humanity dealing with it. Only together can we hope to address this problem. Like war in 0079, we must be united. We cannot fall into the trap of reactionary thinking. We cannot let our souls be weighed down by the gravity of history. But Shar as well says something else. Earth is the cradle of humankind, but humankind must leave the cradle. This quote, often misinterpreted to be from Carl Sagan or others, is actually from Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, one of the fathers of modern astronautics and rocketry. He was, like many of his time, a firm believer that it was through humanity's ascension to space, of embracing that to grow not just physically, but mentally and spiritually, as a species. I do believe somewhere along the line Tomino read some of his work. The parallels between its thinking and Xeon Daikun's and now Shars are plentiful. Now here it would be easy to presume that in following this thinking, that we must do as Elon Musk incoherently advocates, to leave our buckling systems and instead to abandon the earth, to make the greatest, stupidest folly possible, to repeat our failing systems on the countless worlds of space. Musk, despite his insistence on futurism, is really the worst old type imaginable. This is unquestionably fucking stupid. Char, Zeta, but really Tomino, was never advocating for an elite to live in space and to abandon the poor humankind as a whole, or abandon the problems of the Earth. It was with the changing times of Zeta that the growing new type awareness, and with the growing overview effect of our real world, that we should confront this issue of our world here and now. The Zeta proposal has this all outlined in a perfect nutshell within Daikun's philosophy. Mankind must coexist with nature. In order for people to reach a consensus on this principle, they first need to develop an objective, wide-spanning perspective. That being said, the people on Earth have asserted dominion over the planet, and continue to contaminate the planet through careless construction. Why can't they simply leave nature to work its natural, self-sufficient course? At this rate, the planet stands no chance of survival. People are the only creatures who possess both intelligence and the ability to set firm principles that account for the environment. Accordingly, all people should become space noids and emigrate to space, preserving the Earth by leaving it to its natural course. Even if, as Amuro mentions, it requires one or two human sacrifices. A line, my dear viewer, we will return to in the final video in this series. But Shar, despite making the speech, despite being Daikun's son, isn't the best embodiment of it in action. Of the person this changes in Fuzoku requires. No, one I feel embodies this better here more than any other is obviously Camille. Camille who has suffered so much, but who does not break under the strain. It is during this arc that Camille once more encounters four Murasame, ultimately to tragedy. Four is hazy, barely aware and tortured, so that she can become a better weapon for the Titans. Four's memories of Camille have been altered, when Four empties out the last pill of medication, rewatching it this time, it hit me very differently. Personally, but in so many of my friends, people I have known, struggling with, as David Bowie and Freddie Mercury once said, pressure pushing down on me, pushing down on you, no man asks for. The terror of knowing what this world's all about. Is it any wonder so many in my generation and younger have these anxieties and despair, when this frustrating, failing world is what we are left with? driven to the medications of the same system just to endure it. It has simply become, as Tomino and Anno said, that in modern times there are some people for whom that can become Fuzoku. 
As within King Lear, the weight of these sad times we must obey. For was made to be a weapon, and it is as a weapon she is ultimately killed. Of course, by Jared, an irredeemable, complicit tool of this corrupt system. It is as Camille cradles Four's body that the weight of this tragedy really hits. Shar and Amaro look on only with complete sadness that history has repeated the same mistake, that another in their place suffered what both had warned Camille not to do. Only, only Camille doesn't break down. He doesn't end up being destroyed by this. As Kilimanjaro, the environment is destroyed behind them. Camille cradles Four's body and does not look on with tears. He marches resolutely with determination. Thus we see Zeta's next great merit. Four, by extending the philosophy of Gundam past the One Year War, by showing an age of confusion, of changing customs, Zeta combined the stagnating politics, failing environment, and growing burdens of the new age of youth. It brought its characters forward the rhetoric and the ideals of facing those things head on, with the awareness of the overview effect, with the strength from those ideals to face this world as only a sequel could do. He says it bluntly, Shar, who is indecisive about his role within the Aug after Blex's death, has to step up, and step up now. The world, the environment has changed. Humanity has changed. This time and place needs action, needs to avoid the failure of history. He can no longer hide behind the alias of Quattro. He must be Shar Aznebel. He must lead the Aug. It is this version of Shar, this person, who gives the speech at Dakar. Before we get really sucked into Zeta's final arcs and their gravity, it is well worth mentioning the big shifts and changes to the substance of Zeta. That being, its animation. Really, right off the top, it's fairly obvious how a number of things have already drastically changed, and how Zeta, and later Double Zeta and Char's counterattack, would look, move, and sound. I already mentioned the addition of the dedicated mechanical animation director, which really upped the level of quality in the mobile suits visually, but their sounds as well was changed quite a bit. For 0079, most of the sound effects were done by Akihiko Matsuda of Fizz Sound Creation, an audio company. For Zeta, it was instead headed by Masakazu Yokoyama of e &M Planning Center. So many of the sound effects in Zeta were new and original to it, it's really most noticeable in the beam weapons and the mobile suit sounds. Beyond that as well, one thing that may be very notable is the change in character design as well. Yasuhiko would contribute the main bulk of the character designs once more, However, Tomino's insistence on a younger generation of creators taking the lead, Yas wouldn't return to do episode-by-episode episode story direction. This brings up some pretty obvious visual questions, then. If Zeta wasn't 100% Yas, as it was with 0079, where did a lot of those other styles come from? The answer is someone I've already mentioned, Tomonori Kogawa. Now this may sound a bit odd, because Kogawa didn't directly work on Zeta either, so how can this be? The answer lies with Hiroyuki Kitazume. Kitazume was the animation director on many episodes of Zeta. This all may sound a bit confusing. Was it Yasuhigo or Kogawa? These next few quotes should shed light on that. Interviewer. Mr. Kitazume, your involvement with Sunrise Anime began with the theatrical edition of Space Runaway Ideon, correct? Kitazume. Yes, after watching First Gundam, I decided to become an animator and entered a vocational school. But as a student, I was strongly influenced by older Toei animation anime like Mr. Hayao Miyazaki's The Great Adventures of Horus, Prince of the Sun. Toei Animation wasn't taking applications from newcomers, so when I saw Mr. Tomonori Kogawa's character sheets for Blue Gale's A Bungle, published in the magazines, I thought I definitely wanted to work on that animation. At the time, Studio Bibel, a key art and animation studio funded by Mr. Tomonori Kogawa, didn't have any positions for newcomers either, but I asked them and they hired me anyway. So. Kitazume, initially inspired to become an animator by 0079, then worked under and was influenced by Kogawa's style, but was then scouted to work on the upcoming Zeta Gundam project, from the 2005 Z Gundam Nostalgia interview. Mr. Tomonori Kogawa, the founder of Studio Bibao, to which I belonged at the time, had been involved with director Tomino's works for a long time. I've been able to study in between key animation, drawing, and the animator's job under Mr. Kogawa. Then, when I was working on L Game, I started talking to other studio members about whether it was time to go independent. It was just around that time that the Zeta Gundam project came up. When we were forming our new studio pack, the producer asked me, would you like to work with us after you leave Studio Bebo? 
Since I didn't yet know what work I'd be doing after I quit, I said, yes, please. That's how it was decided. It was this connection that really helps to show the blending of styles that would coalesce within Zeta. Much like within Yasuhiku's role within 0079, in doing key animation for characters, the younger members like Kiyazume developed a familiarity with character work and Yasuhiko's in general. Interviewer, what kind of interactions did you have with Mr. Yasuhiko, who was in charge of the character design? Kitazume, when I asked about the project, they showed me Mr. Yasuhiko's character sheets, although they were still preliminary drafts. That's when I first found out that Mr. Yasuhiko was doing the character designs. After that, I was a little puzzled to learn that he wasn't joining the animation staff. When I was at Studio Bibao, in the animation stage, it was simply fine to interpret things based on the style of Mr. Kogawa or Mr. Nagano. We didn't have that this time. The only hints we had were Mr. Yasuhiko's character sheets, and in that situation, it was vexing that we had to make the characters he'd designed move in animation. And what's more, I was responsible for animation direction on episode 1. There's some more great quotes I feel that really get to the core of this. Interviewer. The number of character sheets vary depending on the characters, right? Kitazume. Yes, the protagonist Camille was easier since we had several pages of expression sheets, but there were only a few characters like that. For most of the characters, we had to draw them based on our own imagination. I think if Mr. Yasuhiko had been in charge of animation direction for the first episode, we'd have been able to expect a collection of his revisions afterwards, and we could have devoted ourselves to drawing to match that. But with only the character sheets, I thought I couldn't draw in a way that made it seem like Mr. Yasuhiko himself were drawing it. So rather than doing the impossible, I could only offer my own interpretation based on Mr. Yasuhiko's drawings. Just like I used to do. I thought that was the best I could offer. When you look at his model sheets for first, you clearly understand that they aren't just designs for animation, but drawings by the creator, Yoshikazu Yasuhiko. There were aspects that distinctly separated them from the character designs of other anime works. I thought it would be hopeless trying to express that difference in my own work on Zeta Gundam. Ultimately, I thought I'd try to pick up whatever information I could and follow my own independent route. Around the middle of the story, it seemed that my way of doing things had been accepted. I was even getting a lot of illustration requests from the anime magazines, so I felt properly appreciated, again, that my own intuition hadn't been off the mark. It's from this emergence of styles that I feel Zeta created a really distinct look, a fusion of Kogawa and Yasuhiko. Zeta is 80s, but it's a really specific, refined form of the 80s. The series has many moments of triple tone shading on faces, which really adds to the expression of the stylistic fusion. Kitazume mentions more from the Great Mechanics interview. I was influenced by Tomonori Kogawa. I thought it might work really well if I could contribute that kind of three-dimensional, sketch-like solid drawing with Mr. Yasuhiko's delicacy and character nuances. The biggest difference may be the application of shadows. You can really see this in many shots, especially of them in pilot gear. Their helmets showing the shaping of the face. The fashion of the characters as well especially really speaks to it. Zeta has many certifiably styling moments. The Ayubs, we ain't an army. We the Gorilla Freedom Fighters. How do you know this? Simple. No sleeves. Sleeves? Fascist. Authoritarian. Central government power. No sleeves? Liberated fighters for freedom. The right to bear arms. Some of these outfits, baby. These last few episodes have got a treasure trove. Fog got the Cherry Cowboy. We got Casual Camille. And the Sadaka Serious Camille. Sera la Terrorista Paris. Paptimus putting the headband 80s exercise in polar exercise state. Business serious, come on. I have no idea what's up with Basque's nah, garment. I've seen everything. Number 5. By extending the style of Gundam beyond 0079, Seda opened the way for a fusion of Kogawa and Yasuhiko's design influences to bind together in characters and in animation. This style combined with the heightened detail of pushed Gundam's visual world forward as only a sequel could. With all that in mind, we can rejoin our show. Shar and Camille return to space, with Amuro still staying on the Earth. During their launch, Shar restates the core of Zeta, of UC, with Camille firmly saying he believes in that promise. It is back in space where we see the AU's forces struggle against Yazan and Paptimus. We also see those fucking kids around, but I'll get to them in the next section. Really, the main thing is, after having apparently died in battle, Rekua has clearly survived and is now defected to the Titans. Also, rip to batch, whoever you were. You died to fill out a redshirt casualty rate. This leads us to perhaps one of the strangest episodes in Zeta, By the Lake. The setup of this episode is really a parallel to 0079's fateful encounter, only uh, it's undermined by everything in it. Rosami is a very weird and redundant character we will get to soon enough. Functionally though, Camille's Lala was four, 
The whole thing is kind of fun, but also just kind of weird. Camille and Fa bump into Maneva and Haman. At least the Argama gets repaired. I also have to kind of laugh at the construction of a massive space colony where you build giant, unusable, rocky mountains purely for aesthetics. Yay for Swiss representation, I guess. The most interesting thing here is Jamatov and Basque in their certifiably HELL BIG FIRE room, talking about how the Titans are fully weaponizing cyber new types like Rosami to fight against the Ayuk. Even more than 0079, it feels like the old type new type crisis is what's really driving the plot at this point. We also see that the Titans have retrofitted not just Grips 1 and 2 into weapons factories and a colony laser, but also have renovated and are using the resource asteroids turned space fortresses of Luna 2 and Aobawaku. This really climaxes then in the big episode that kicks off Zeta's final arc. Episode 40, Activation of Grips. I do really enjoy Emma's reaction to like, who is this friggin' Rosami person? The Titans are readying the Grips colony laser, a modernized and more efficient version of the Xeon weapon. By the end of the episode, it will be ready to fire. We see the most obvious and simplistic manipulation of Rekoa by Paptimus. And it's just so- it's so fucking stupid. Ah, breathe in and out, Arpenhold. Okay, we're gonna get to this in the next section. We're gonna stay calm. The Ayug moves its forces to try to engage the Titans. During this, Camille and Rekoa sense each other, and Camille is devastated to find her both alive and working for them. Camille is justifiably chewing her out for why she defected. What it will mean is new types to have to fight one another to death. God, Rekwa is like, there's no fucking real defense for a complete bullshit. Hey there, Archibald here. Notice how during these shots, the characters lose definition on their chin while looking upwards? This was a staple technique of Kogawa, seen in his other works like Ideon. Here, Kitazume is inherited and kept up this neat stylistic approach. Shit. The battle is goddamn inconclusive. And out of nothing but guilt, Rekwa tells Camille that the colony laser is complete. The Titans then test fire the laser on low output severely damaging a colony and killing probably tens of thousands of people in the process. All to ready their weapon for their main attack on the lunar cities, the strongholds of the Ayuk. Camille senses all this death, just like how Amaro sensed the Xeon weapon firing back in 0079, and is emotionally shaken by it. Bright and the Ayug members are infuriated at the brutality of the Titans, and Rekua, fucking Rekua, cradles her pathetic, traitorous form, a veritable stupid puppet dancing on idiot strings for Paptimus. Oh, oh, pitiful me, I can't go back to the Ayug now, I have joined the genocidal space totalitarians. Woo -hoo -hoo. Fuck you, Rekua. You know what? That's fucking it. It's goddamn time for... The second 0079 movie, Soldiers of Sorrow, had a song composed and created for it, sharing its name. The lyrics of the song have one passage in particular, to dying men, to all their good women, to dying girls, to all their boyfriends, to dying men, to all their women, to all our loved ones, peace we will protect. As I mentioned in the previous video, the importance of female fans to the success of Gundam was nothing small. But beyond that, the role of gender and sex within Gundam was a conscious one. 0079, for its time, expanded and sought to create many memorable and complex female characters. So when it came time for Zeta, the role of woman, the importance of their presence, was a major one to the age of Zeta Gundam, described. However, at the same time, it's perhaps the single most difficult and messy one in terms of what it became. Like Camille, or environmentalism and new types, it's hard to begin. Camille even earlier on notes the strange high presence of women within the series itself. Perhaps the best place to start would be the proposal, and this is where it's all pretty much laid out. But I should warn you now, the ideas it is getting at are strange and very haphazard at times. From that outline, soldiers that die without a cause are not really soldiers. A true soldier can only die for the sake of his comrades. A soldier is only able to give up his life when the preservation of his species is ensured. This conviction is held until death. From the perspective of the average person, the soldier's way of life is sad and fleeting. This is especially poignant when these soldiers are coerced and manipulated by those in power. These soldiers are supported by the presence of women. Women are fundamentally unable to become pilots because their nature is aligned with preservation. This inherent inclination is also a primary element of survival, and women have no reprieve from this role. Once born as a female, even if her nature deviates from its natural course, women will either assume this role or yearn for it. This puts women on equal footing with men. 
Women aspire to be equal with men in stature. This aspiration is what separates women from men. We won't be debating the validity of this aspiration. At the same time, it is because of these women that the men, as pilots, are able to face their deaths. Accordingly, these women serve as an important role in conveying what it means to be a pilot. Women aspire to convey the hopes and desires that will be inherited by their children and future pilots. This is the primitive expression of the species. This is a future when this natural course has become warped. This is the age of Zeta Gundam and the pilots who live in this era. There is, well, putting it lightly, a lot to unpack in all that. It simultaneously got a lot of sexist baggage coloring it right next to compliments and for the mid-1980s kind of interesting ideas on how the idea of women and pilots overlap. It won't surprise you then when I say Zeta as a whole is similarly charged with this strange contradiction in its use of the presence of women. On the one hand, what Zeta's proposal is espousing is the now quite frequently researched idea that women are less inclined to take risks men do, that this inhibits their ability to fight, or specifically, pilot 18 meter rainbow robots. This idea is a persistent one even today. Some studies looked at, ironically very relevant to Gundam, human brain waves. One test suggesting some connection between more theta wave activity in their frontal lobes and in the interior cingulate cortex when selecting decisions based on risk. Relating this difference might be caused by testosterone, the masculine hormone present 10 to 20 times more in men and responsible for a huge number of effects. Participants had to select random boxes with a hidden amount of money inside, but with the risk that picking a losing box wiped their entire winnings. The men gambled on picking more boxes than women. Other studies suggest an evolutionary reasoning, that when men and women, homo sapiens, evolved, the nature of prolonged pregnancy meant women had a higher evolutionary pressure to select outcomes based on minimized risk, as the loss of the mother meant the loss of the child. Thus, risk aversion became a sex-related trait. Men, meanwhile, had to search for food, had to provide while the female was with child. In this situation, in that case, Taking risks could lead to big advantages in finding a dying animal ready to kill and eat, or a plant which could be poisonous, but could also be edible and nutritious. After all, if the father dies, the woman survives, as does the child. Or perhaps, as another theory suggests, the pressure was in showing off for women. In competing for limited females in the massive social groups humans existed within, females who, once impressed, are fertile year-round, unlike most other mammals. This drove men to take risks to impress and earn mates in a tough social space. Wow, it all seems to just make so much sense. I mean, look at the human history. Men are leaders, are fighters, are fighter pilots, kings and generals and emperors. See? Brainwaves, evolution, psychology, it all explains it. Right? Only, of course, on the other hand, it was never that simple. So sorry, Jordan Peterson and all the evolutionary psychology fans out there, you can't get, wow, no way, a perfect convenient logic for your latent sexism with an overly simple explanation. That's the real poison of this line of thinking. It's just way, way too simple and easy. It's the appeal, but it's also the flaw. Take that brainwave study I mentioned. How many people did it test? Well, a grand total of 35. An okay sample size for figuring out if theta waves are linked to risk, but not some rock-solid concrete open and shut Wow, the men have the more theta waves, the psychomu is gonna resonate more, oh yeah. The men on average opened only 8 more on one try, and only 13 more boxes on another try. So proportionally, the men were more risky, but only by a bit. B but what about the evolutionary studies? One which measured decision-making at a bus stop by a university did show men more likely to take risks overall crossing a busy road, but once again only by a slight margin. Also, seemingly initiating a crossing of other people, women were present. Okay, that seems to check out. However, paradoxically, when it comes to initiating a crossing first, as a leader, after waiting in front of a busy road, in the highest risk traffic conditions it was women who handily outgambled men. Worth noting is that this study was conducted anonymously on around a thousand people. 475 women and 524 men. So even with almost 50 more men than women, the women were only slightly less risk averse, but the sample size is still pretty small compared to the 7 billion humans on Earth. So the relationship just isn't as simple as it seems. Men are, broadly, generally more risky, 
but with big specific circumstances and influences on that. The other obvious thing worth mentioning is that, surprisingly, all of our scientific studies were conducted on, this is going to blow you away, modern humans. Modern people are the product of a vast and immense series of systems, nations, politics, religions. These things have warped and dictated our ideas of a man and a woman. So it becomes a chicken and egg issue, where while perhaps seeming true in abstract, in detail these same concrete facts buckle and become clouded. Nature and nurture are cycling within the core of civilization. Gender and sex, these things as well, are changing because of razor blade companies, body hair amounts, and style became a gendered thing. As Thekia Morganroth talks about in a study from the Psychology of Women Quarterly, many of the traditional studies involved questions that had societal bias. If you ask, Would you ride a big Harley Davidson? versus, Would you like to try out a dangerous gymnastics to get on the cheerleading squad? Wow, hey! Suddenly, our preconceptions of gender will start biasing our end results. There are tasks we see as masculine, and tasks we see mostly as feminine. After all, women face way more risk of death from childbirth on average in the United States than skydivers face death skydiving. So clearly, for the survival of the species, and as women, taking risks insofar as their socially expected behavior, having kids, is totally, 100% allowed and endorsed by society. But that's the rub of it. If the society you live in rewards your risk-taking behavior based on your gender, then you're gonna have a positive feedback loop. When a man pursues ambition, he's rewarded for serving the systems that created him. When a woman does, it was, for most of human history, looked down on, condemned, and seen as strange. Female leaders face a higher barrier. Most of them exist as exceptions to the systems that created them. The most obvious example is the elephant in the room I've been dancing around. Women can, do something in real life which perfectly highlights this point. They can join the military, now more so than ever. Women can fight. Women can now become, ta-da, fighter pilots. Now currently, it's not a lot. Less than 7% of all US Air Force pilots. And this also, you know, it doesn't really ask, is being part of the military-industrial complex good? But compared to when Zeta was created almost 40 years ago, it is a reality. What was once an absolute, no women can't fight, can't become pilots, can't resist the G-forces needed, were not so absolute. In fact, ironically, by being shorter on average than men, women have less distance between their heart and brain, meaning their ability to keep blood and oxygen flowing is actually, biologically, slightly better than men by default. So even that old sexist absolute isn't true. So, with all that being said, we can now return to Zeta itself and its fairly extensive female cast, and how they can show this, for worse or better, Already, Zeta has 12 fairly significant female recurring characters. This is double 0079's representation. It makes up fully about 40 to 45%-ish of the cast, with many being important members of the story. This was pretty ambitious as an increase. Like holy shit, even TNG managed to double original Star Trek's ongoing female character count from, uh, one to two. So doing this in Zeta really highlighted the changing Fuzoku, the times and growing importance of women. However, as I've already said, it's not all good. Wowee, Argonbolt, you, a man, is gonna judge woman, really reinforcing the negative systemic- No! Dear viewer, me, Argonbolt, a human, mostly, is gonna judge female characters written by several 1985 Japanese men and women. If you're curious about the exact ratio, Yushiyuki Tamino, Akinori Endo, Hiroshi Onogi, Yumiko Suzuki, and Miho Maruo did script writing. So, two of the five series writers were women. Now, it's probably a safe guess that that correlation between female writers and female characters is not a coincidence. The ratio of script writing by episode is further. Decades before idiots complained about forced diversity, Zeta was doing this to make a point about the changing shape of the world and its relationship with sex and gender. To bring more people, more young people, more young women in. However, once again, once again, while there's a lot of ladies in Zeta, and also ladies writing Zeta, that doesn't mean it's all gumdrops and roses. Zeta was ambitious in its attempted scope of female characters, but in execution it is very, um, inconsistent. 
boy, if only there was a way to show that off with a numbered list! Now presenting Argon Bolt's official Zeta Gundam Top 5 Champ Rat and Champ Rat Female Character Ranking. Here we can go over the show's events up to episode 46 and see how the show's Strong Scrolls and Steam Killers demonstrate a really notable strong point of Zeta's writing, as well as some of its biggest weaknesses. The main criteria I'm using are pretty straightforward. One, how well are the characters written? Two, as female characters, how are they written? Three, what are their ultimate goals? Four, what is the purpose within the series? And five, do they feel like a real woman, like a real person? With that, let's begin. Four comes in at number five, which I know sounds low, and you know, you think with her name or something, or anyway, if the list was all the entries on a one to ten scale, four would be better than half the female cast, and she is. Four has some really strong points going for her. She's a genuinely tragic character and you can't help but feel for her. Not because she's totally 80s conventionally attractive, but because of who she is as a cyber new type. In this way, she makes a really good counterpoint to the character of Camille and is awakening new type abilities in her romance with him. So why is she only fifth then? No, well, because that's kind of her only reason to exist as a character. She's like a condensed and even more tragic version of Lala Soon. The writers were making a parallel, and the characters note this obvious one-to-one. -one. She exists as a Romeo and Juliet, or Camille and Cinderella romantic partner, to briefly but powerfully push Camille forward. We really don't see her as a character existing for her own, or really on her own. Which is okay, I would say her inclusion is justifiable, and the subtle differences were great for a female character in Gundam's sequel to do something different from just being another Lala. She may only be rank 5, but she's on the good side for sure. Whoa, whoa, a double entry? Is that allowed? Yes, it's my list. I make the rules. Namely though, both of these characters are kind of the best of the worst. What I feel makes this true is their role and their identity. Both Sarah via Paptimus and Maneva via Haman exist to be puppets of larger players. That isn't to say that there isn't anything good about them, not at all. Sarah is fascinating because she can so clearly manipulate cats in the way Paptimus manipulated her, with emotion and deception. We can see the corruption of new types in Sarah, someone who uses their expanded empathy not to understand, but to twist others to their will. Likewise, Maneva has some very interesting stuff in how Shar and Haman play off of one another around her. The emotion I get from these scenes is like, 100% all oh, the divorced parents are arguing over custody. Shar seeing Maneva becoming a figurehead puppet down to her Zabi heritage is so hardcore. I haven't seen my daughter in four years and you did this, Haman? Of a scene. But beyond that, Maneva's role just isn't that expansive. She's a secondary character and prize for Haman to control. Sarah, likewise, with Paptimus. Sarah's death then at the hands of Katz is another, another friggin' Lala parallel. It's tragic, but even within Zeta, we get the sense of like, hey, we got the classic Amuro and Lala steak and potatoes. Then we got Camille and Four for a spicy carne asada twist. Then Katz and Sarah is like a microwave burrito version of that. It's filling, but you've had better. Beltorchica in some ways very much parallels Four. Like Four for Camille, Beltorchica really exists as a motivation for Amuro. Someone who can come and yank his ass out of the relative introverted melancholy he is in post One Year War. She just sort of barges in and starts using romance as a lure to somewhat activate his potential. In that aspect, we get more of a sense of who Beltorchica is versus Four. Four was mentally crippled by the Titans towards the end. While this makes her more tragic, it is, you know, by design, also robbing Four of her agency. Beltorchica never sacrificed this. She is a Karaba and Ayuk member because she herself believes in the cause. While it is true she shows up, finds, and essentially then orbits Amuro, you do get a real sense of who she is in her relatively brief screen time. It pisses the other characters off how much she just walks into Amuro's life, but it shows she is doing it out of her own will. It's a much less hazy romance than the new type magnetism of Four, but very confident, so I'll give it points for that. Yeah, it's convincing. The reason I throw her down here is pretty simple. You may think it's her role as a tragic motivator for Camille, which is partially true, but it's something more than that. You see, in Aura Battler Dunbine, the main character returns to Earth after fighting in fantasy bug mech world for months. On his return, he is deposited back to his home in Japan, and his parents are there. The mother in particular is something that Hilda Bidan is as well. 
something I find fucking annoying and perhaps maybe one of Tomino's biggest uh-oh gender problems. The neglectful academic career woman mother. This is, in a vastly simplistic sense, the thesis of brain powered as well. Tomino, in the past, seemed to react to the growing agency of women pursuing their careers with a kind of traditional sexist anxiety. But this would cause the neglect and anger which would create a Camille Bidon. Women won't fill out their role as maternal caregiver, and this will cause societal anguish. This is obviously a very old and sexist mindset. Fathers in Japan became salarymen, and in the process blatantly neglected their kids pretty often. Amaro's dad is just such an example, as is the equally infamous Gendo Ikari from Evangelion. But this was never seen as destroying the stability of society, despite the negative consequences. As I've already mentioned, when women pursue power, pursue careers, they get hit much harder because of the default assumption of their role. That isn't to say it's unbelievable that a woman like Hilda could exist, nor that it's necessarily a bad backstory for Camille, but it's an incredibly loaded one. One loaded unequally against women in particular. And just to be clear, I'm not advocating for any kind of career neglect from parents. Raising children is important, it's also very hard. Raising weirdos like Camille, and myself, is also very hard. But within Zeta, Camille himself complains that it was his mother's career that caused her to ignore the infidelity of her husband, further adding to Camille's anger. It's Camille's mother's fault for not being both motherly and acting as wife. As an alternative, why didn't Camille say, my father wasn't satisfied with my mother and turned to other women instead of working that out, while my mother hid in her career in shame? It's a very small change, but you can see how gender and sex are deep fried in the society we live in and its expectations. Really Camille, sorry. Both your parents were shit, but your dad was worse. Perfectly tying into my point here is Haman. Haman is a great antagonist and villain, but also a pretty good example all around. Haman is self-motivated, has goals, has pursuits. If she can use Shar, she will. If not, then she'll do otherwise. You get a sense that Haman is here for Haman first, not a male character. Oh, Argon! What about Char's deleted affair? Hmm, I wonder what that was. Probably the wind. Anyway, as I was saying, Haman is kind of funny as a hashtag gaslight gatekeeping girl boss. She will do her best to restore a fascist space ethnostate empire, which only makes this funnier. She is, after all, a villain. This is also why she's kind of only third. Society has a lot of negative associations with women trying to take power. Once again, there's a reason the Wicked Witch and the Evil Stepmother and the Cruel Queen are traditional mythological villains. When women seize power, they get a lot of shit for it, and are blamed for being out of tune with their natural cause. But man, Haman has some real highlights all the same. She smashes the Titan's renovated Albao coup with Axis, destroying it. She tries to assassinate Jamatov, the fucking Dune Tier cyanide earring. She plays both the Titans and Ayug off of one another, and plays the game of power and politics with a passionate intensity. She won't help Char until he comes and grovels, then will cripple Grips to the Ayug's advantage. By the end of the series, she and Neo Zeon will both survive the war and have strength left over. She's a good leader in that way, and her female nature, while villainized, is part of that. Both of these characters are basically the same. An older woman impressed with Jared's passion, I don't know, intensity? I really don't care. They just like him for some reason. Then Jared is a stooge of the status quo, then Camille puts him on ice. Simple as. Both of them are just in waiting to become body bag liners. I never got a great sense of why either were really so attracted to Jared beyond wanting to mother his potential. But it's Jared! Jared never fucking learns, never sees the error of the Titans. That's why Camille continuing to murder his workers and associates is so cathartic. He brings it on his own head. By the end of the series, Camille has surpassed Jared so much it's clear Jared isn't even on the same level. By that same extension, these people don't really exist beyond that very much. The role as women is mainly to be there as a double knife in Jared's giant stupid gut, both his comrades and his lovers. As a romantic penalty, and a carrot on a stick, Camille can crush and then punch Jared in the nose with. It's entertaining in that sense, um, but not much more. No real surprise here, Emma is great. Emma starts as a Titans member, sees the sheer evil they commit, grows a conscience, and defects to the AU. In that way, she earns a lot of thumbs up for me. This is how a human would react, someone who can, you know, have realizations and changes in motivation when they live in and see more of the world. At the same time, her aspect as a woman isn't something that gets in the way. 
She even says bluntly that she knows if she got too close to Camille, she would basically become a motherly romantic figure to him. And she ain't here for that. She isn't here to become some Beltorchica leading Camille by the nose with romance or sexual appeal. At the same time, when Captain Henkin tries to show romantic interest in her, she doesn't seem to initially know how to handle it. She feels more like a normal person dealing with emotions than the very magnetically drawn together and dreamy new types like Camille or Lala or Amaro. More than that as well, she is a pilot the whole series through. She starts fighting and she never stops, until the tragedy of the final arc we will get to soon. I like this a lot. It shows a conviction, an actualization of her character, even more so than Sela, who is fighting primarily just to survive in 0079. Emma fights because the Ayug is humanity's best hope for defeating the Titans. So why is she only two? Well, because after the initial arc, she does sort of move into the background quite a bit. She has her arc pretty much completed by the time the Earth drop on Jabiro happens. Not that this is a bad thing overall, you know, better a well-realized, if complete, female character than one that has additional shitty, <coughs> you know, how events happen. A very solid entry for one of the better female characters in Gundam. Remember the food joke I made a little earlier with Sarah and Katz being the breakfast burrito? Well, Rosami and Camille is the 7-Eleven 4am burrito. Rosami in general is a completely redundant romantic interest. With 4, we have already seen the tragic cyber new type story arc, the evil of the Earth Federation and the Titans in creating them. What she does end up adding apart from that is, um, crap. She says Camille is her brother, but we know it's just Titans programming more than likely. She acts like an annoying little child. That's her big difference from 4. We know she's gonna die sooner or later, we've seen this idea three times already, including twice in this very show, the fourth doesn't add anything more. Excellent. Yeah, no surprise here, the main female protagonist is number one. Fa to Frau to me feels a lot like Camille to Amaro. Another version of the same idea, but done differently, and a bit better than Frau. She's motivated to join the Ayug, both to take care of Camille, sure, but also because, like Camille, she has seen the evil of the Titans and has been affected. More than Frau, she also keeps piloting through the series. Even though it frightens her a lot initially, she's pretty much terrified. She doesn't back down from this responsibility. Now I know, you could make some easy arguments here. Oh, isn't she just there to baby Camille? Doesn't she just get stuck with those stupid friggin' kids? In both, I feel the depth of Fa's character, especially as a female one, comes out. At multiple points, while it's true she's essentially mothering Camille, she also isn't tolerant of his bullshit either. When Camille is moody and sad and angered from the loss of his parents, she refuses to indulge in some kind of spurious therapeutic romantic indulgences for him. She isn't going to compromise because it's not something she's comfortable with, and I like that a lot. Likewise, when Camille is still hazy from his encounter with Four, Fa tries to reach out to him, but it takes a while for them to make up and come to terms with one another. There's this great sense that their relationship is one made of two imperfect but reacting humans and people. There's a very good sense of depth to Fa, and she isn't flat, nagging, childhood friend archetype that shows up so many places in anime, despite seeming that way perhaps on the surface initially. Then we get the kids. Okay, first off, the kids are stupid. The white base was a family, so the kids being there sort of served that. But the Argama is a rebel army's flagship. The flimsy justification Char has for bringing them along, they feel very much like 0079 had kids, uh, so I guess we will as well. This is the final thing then that relates to Fa. She ends up being saddled with taking care of them. Initially this made me despise them quite a lot. Why didn't Bright or Char have to take care of them? Why don't the men have to enact a kind of fatherly care? Of course the answer should be obvious. Fa is a woman, and women in tradition are the caregivers. So then, Argenbolt, why do you think Fa is number one? This sounds exactly like what you were outlining as being a negative stereotype. Well, quite simply, because after that period, Fa goes back to piloting. She, in the end, doesn't give up fighting for the Ayuk. It was really here that I came around to, not just, well, not the kids, I still hate them, but to their role with Fa in particular. Ultimately, in our modern world, many women don't give up the job of caring for children. They have to learn to balance this against their career pursuits. It's not an easy task, it's a, basically a double burden that men don't face nearly as often or at all in the traditional power structure. For them, their career and its benefits are one and the same, and their main obligation. It was within this then that Fa really won me over. The fact that she takes care of the kids but still fights alongside Camille. Fa here does basically what both Sela and Frau did independently in 0079, all by herself. 
Despite this burden she takes on, she is also, as we will soon tragically see, one of the few survivors of this war. This showed a real emotional and physical strength that, at least to me, earned her the top spot. Fuck Rekua. Rekua is unquestionably a bad character, both in the personal sense of a bad person and in the writing sense of a badly written female character. When you have a cast with some really strong personalities, and specifically memorable ones like Camille, Char, Emma, Haman, and so on, men and women, a bad apple stands out even more. She's a member of the Eu. She shows their evils to Emma, getting her to defect, only to then be drawn via Paptimus to turn sides and join the Titans under him. This is so fucking dumb, I can hardly understate it. But, but, but Argon, she was manipulated. Oh, amazing, a female character totally robbed of agency because of a male character. That's great logic. I love that. Fuck you. And what spurred this? Oh, boo-hoo, Char wouldn't validate my impulsive female emotional needs. Ah, yes, another thing I love. A character acting irrationally based on gender, that being female. She became a member of the AU, the rebel army, because it was just exciting? Really? And when it wasn't fun enough or validating, she just leaves? I'm sorry, but like seriously, fuck you. This is trash. Listen, not all characters have to be flawless. All too often, Hollywood especially makes the flat as hell, stereotypical action woman. Even Star Wars did it. But there's a flawed reasoning, as with Emma's initially, flaw in motives and goals, as with Haman, even flawed in experience, as Fa acts emotionally frustrated with Camille's bullshit sometimes. But the difference is those flaws exist within characters, within more distinctive and rounded personalities. They make sense. Haman is a baddie. The Neo Zeon are bad. But Haman, at least until Char's deleted piece of shit, within Zeta is fairly self determined. Rekua's motivation is the motivation of a child, or basically, a woman child. Then she half heartedly helps the genocidal titans with their gassing, pitying herself, and weeping, Oh, woe is me, I cannot return now. Then when the Ayuk members like Char and Camille confront her and are clearly distressed at her betrayal, she offers these frankly fucking pathetic sexist excuses. I feel content as a woman. There are men and women. Like good fucking god, it's terrible. I know Requo's decision is a bad one. The writers wanted to be seen, probably, as bad. Beyond that, it's still an arc they wrote for her character. A turd sandwich on purpose is still a turd inside a sandwich. Imagine if Camille joined the Titans because Four got him laid. Or Char sided with Haman betraying his ideals and everything he fought for because she made him content as a man. Flipping the gender shows just how, and I apologize if some dislike this term, fucking colossally retarded Rekua is. I feel zero empathy at all for her. She fought her whole life as a resistance fighter for no other reason than an adrenaline rush? Are you fucking kidding me? Is some kind of apolitical thrill seeker? Risking life and limb and saw friends die and never ever believed in any cause? What kind of ideological vacuum, philosophical fucking black hole, is Rekua Lond? No, not even the proposal helps here, there was supposed to be some weird love triangle with Camille and Char that never made it to the show, thank god. So yeah, Rekua is quite literally the worst. So there you have it. 6. In expanding the presence of women beyond Mobile Suit Gundam, Zeta ambitiously opened up far more room for the inclusion of them. This attempt was not perfect carrying sexist ideas over into the new age, but it also in many places succeeded in defying old norms, and created some of the most notable female cast members in Gundam with its writing. With all that said, we can now wrap up Zeta with its very fun and happy ending involving quite a lot of smiles and jokes! With Jamatov's death, the finale of Zeta is like the Operation the Ayug launches. One giant descent into the Dark Maelstrom. The Neo Zeon Axis forces, the Ayug's Argama, and the Titans and Jupiter Energy Fleet under Paptimus are locked in a death spiral. There, Haman and Paptimus do battle. Here, Paptimus has essentially become a Dark Amaro, a new type who opted to use his potential to manipulate and control people. Look no further than this fight where Paptimus replicates Amaro's technique from 0079 tracing Haman's quibbly new type weapons in their control lines. Sarah meets her end at the hands of Kotz. In the end, Haman's forces gain control of the Grips 2 colony laser. This forces the Ayug to launch Operation Maelstrom. 
attacking with their entire remaining forces. It is during this attack that Camille and Haman come face to face. For every single of the last four episodes, Camille will basically be pushed to his limit further and further just like this. Camille and Haman's new type potential resonate. They try to see the emotion of each other via their memories of other people and their past relations. In Haman, Camille senses something like his mother, a force of will. In Camille, Haman senses a presence like Char's. However, they do not reach an understanding. In the end, Haman stubbornly refuses this awakening Camille lashes out at, in anger. The Ayug drives the Neo Zeon from Grips 2. Operation Maelstrom is a success. The Ayug now control the single most powerful weapon of the war. Shar tragically says Camille is following Amuro's path, in being engrossed by the potential solution to war new type sensations offer. Haman and Neo Zeon, having lost Grips 2, have directed Axis to collide with the Lunar City, Granada. The Argama alone goes to try to reindirect it, to try to prevent a catastrophe. Camille is now more resolute than ever in the duty he has to carry out. Ode Rekoa will kill Basque Om as well, leaving Paptimus in singular control of the Titan's forces. Rosamia makes her final appearance. We already know, and have already known, how this will all end. Like the Psycho Gundam 2, it is a mostly redundant repetition. Even its fate is no different from the original in 4s. The Ayug uses Grips 2's laser to redirect Axis. Granada, once more, is saved. But the forces from Axis and the Titans launch their main attack on Grips 2 in response. Shar tries to counsel Camille again, but despite expecting him to, once again, break, as Amuro and Shar did at losing Lala, Camille's internal strength of character perseveres. As he says, he couldn't live with being a new type if he didn't do that much. And make Shar react with regret? Shame? Is he pitying the burden on Camille, or pitying that he so regularly shows strength beyond him and Amuro? The final two episodes then, Casualties of War and Riders in the Skies, are essentially just the one long finale of this five episode long final battle. The Radish's crew does fierce battle. Emma kills both of Yazan's wingmen, but Katz as well loses his life to Yazan in turn. Captain Henkin and the Radish is destroyed as well by Yazan. Jared makes his final pathetic sortie, and Camille, enraged at the deaths of so many of his comrades, crushes him once and for all. Jared's last spoken words being to proclaim Camille as his rival before being lethally cut off. Jared Char does battle with Paptimus and Haman. The real spotlight is Emma and Rekua's final battle. The once allies turned enemies clash. Emma kills Rekua, but in the process of trying to discern just that kill, is mortally wounded herself. Once again, Camille resonates in his new type rage and passion destroy Yazan's mobile suit. Camille has become the avatar of retribution against those who have callously thrown away human lives for their selfish pursuits. Yazan, for Zeta at least, escapes from the final battle. Camille ushers the wounded Emma to a crippled ship. Once there, she begs Camille to use the last of her life force to end the war. I know it might sound strange, but really, anyone who fights in a war is doing just that. Sacrificing their life, and the time spent fighting, or in mortal effort for a cause. She has already seen Camille do this against Yazan. Shar, Haman, and Paptimus fight within the Grips 2 laser, damaging it and delaying its firing, until leaving their mobile suits behind. They then arrive at one of Zeta's most powerful scenes, the theater. Here, the final philosophy of the show is laid bare, like the speech at Dakar. Haman wants a reactionary return to the imperial authoritarianism of Zeon. She even throws out a remark that it is a woman who needs to do so and will make it work. Decades before the disdain at the girl boss archetype manifested, the disdain that no, a broken system headed by a woman, be it queen, an empire, or business, will not be fixed. Haman here embodies that perfectly. Shar rejects this pathetic ploy. Join me, Shar, she says. But this scene as well shows Shar hesitation. I don't want to take this world in the wrong direction. Shar's core arc within Zeta is that being torn apart by the ability to both lead humanity down to his Zeon blood, but by, at the same time and same metric, afraid of making the wrong decisions. It's what has made him compelling. But this isn't Shar's story, it's Camille's. He arrives as well and projects a new type pressure onto the players on the stage. He says the Ayug's philosophy, those whose souls are pulled down by gravity should not lead the new age. But he says this with conviction. Camille has become the embodiment of this cause. But even saying this, Camille is enraged at the cost in human lives this debate over ideas has reaped. 
Paptimus is Camille's counterpart, an elitist, an Ayn Rand type. I am a genius. I am better than all of you. A raw, egotistical new type who only seeks himself in control. He is the antithesis to Tomino's hope that all humankind could become new types. As Camille puts it oh so well, what good is a world that ignores people's minds? In the end, the standoff is broken by Fa. No real change of ideology was possible, but now all the cards have been laid bare and the final battle is ready. They exit in their mobile suits from Grips 2. At last, the charging is ready. Bright fires the colony laser. There's one final sad shot of Emma's body, and the beam surges across space and vaporizes the main bulk of the Titans' fleet, and a portion of the Axis forces as well. The Titans can no longer win against the Ayuk, and Haman orders Neo Zeon to withdraw and preserve its strength. Amid this, she asks one final time for Shar to join her, to rule over the Earth Sphere with her. He, of course, refuses, and is seemingly defeated. Then, the final battle of Camille and Paptimus is at hand. Camille does what Emma wished him to do. He absorbs the energy, the life force of the new type essences of the dead, all those lost in the war. With that power, that rage, the Zeta radiates a fearsome light. Even the ghost of Sarah tries one final time to prevent this, but Katz's spirit consoles her. Paptimus is aghast at the power and unable to comprehend it. It is with this overwhelming attack, with this roar, that Camille rams Paptimus, killing him. But with his last effort of new type power, he enacts a heavy toll. Camille's mind and soul have been altered. The sacrifice Amaro suspected of this era of confusion has come to pass, and Camille has willingly become it. The female presence, the lives of most of the cast, allies and enemies have been taken. Only a small few, Bright, Fa, Haman, Camille, have survived, as it is hinted Shar has as well at the end, but with a heavy, heavy cost. The world has survived. This chapter of Gundam is concluded. Zeta Gundam has ended. I began with the question, did Zeta need to exist? Did Gundam need a sequel? I have hopefully, by now, shown that in many ways, the answer was both yes. Zeta was clearly doing new things, different things. It was born from a genuine desire not simply to repeat 0079. It embraced an era of confusion and change. It wanted to explore and expand on the world of Gundam be it with the added depth of returning characters, the political ideas of the overview effect, environmentalism, political action, or in the vastly expanded female presence, in a protagonist rife with the kinds of modern social maladjustment that resonated with me 30 years after its airing. For this, Zeta has become a critical darling of many fans. It's a work which, with age, has retained a lot of endearing value, and retained a lot of popularity to boot. When I have talked to people, many people, personally, Zeta regularly ranks as one of their favorites. It was, and is, a big personal favorite. Zeta Gundam as well is, still to this day, the single highest TV ratings of any Gundam series, in Japan or outside of it, at 11% with an average viewing of 6%, beating 0079 and many later Gundam shows. Not even Seed at the height of its popularity in Japan, nor the West's explosive love for Gundam Wing, its number one show while airing on Toonami could dislodge Zeta's top spot. When NHK hosted a Gundam mega poll back in 2018 for Japanese fans to rank all Gundam works ever, with some 1.7 million people submitting rankings, Zeta Gundam came second overall only to 0079 for best work. The Zeta Gundam mobile suit itself came second, only to CCA's new Gundam, and Camille Bidan came fourth for character in a specific show. So why then did Tomino react so negatively after finishing Zeta? Maybe it was the fact Tomino felt it didn't keep up or attract enough new fans. Or maybe it was Tomino unhappy that the political tone and complicated and emotionally angry characters like Camille didn't resonate more. Maybe he really, really wanted another anime Shinseki Sengen. Ultimately, making a major sequel is no easy thing. Metal Gear Solid 2 confused and angered fans, but now stands as one of the most important philosophical moments in video games. The Last of Us 2, likewise, still got heaps of flack for just defying fan expectations and doing something weird and different. This is the problem of expectations with a cultural synchronicity event. When The Matrix was The Matrix for a huge number of big cultural reasons, was The Matrix Reloaded ever gonna realistically match that? Quality of the work aside, some things exist beyond the scope of the art that they seem to catalyze within them. 0079 was the anime generation coming of age, and Tomino telling a story that resonated along multiple ley lines of that time and place. 
Zeta, coming out in 1985, was a different world. Anime was now booming and an established thing within Japan. But that really sells Zeta's effort short. Zeta was the anime generation joining the workforce, and now, in so many people, Nagano, Imagawa, Uchida, and so on, creating the sequel to the work that inspired them in the first place. It catapulted literally dozens of careers who would go on to shape the anime industry, mecha, and Japanese science fiction for the next decades up until right now. So sorry, 1985 Tomino, you may not have resonated enough for him, but if 0079 and Gundam is the Star Wars of Japan, then Zeta is, without a doubt, Empire Strikes Back. It's darker, it's different, but it's also pretty unquestionably fucking good. However, unlike Episode 5, Zeta has some big meaty ideas in a setting painfully close to our lived reality, which makes it special. Zeta aspired to achieve something new, amidst the confusion and stagnation of a new era. In Camille Bedan's personal struggle, in its returning cast united against the status quo, in its wide female characters and environmental and political themes, in Camille rising and changing to meet those challenges. In execution, some of these may have failed to fully reach the scope of their goals, but in just attempting this and getting as far as they did, and actually achieving so many, it rebelled against the pressure of being a conventional sequel to a massive work like 0079. It earned its place as a worthy and interesting successor and continuation of the world of Mobile Suit Gundam. Perhaps most importantly, in a world rife with so many of the same issues, just the valiant effort of the Ayu, of Shar, Amaro, Emma, Fa, and Camille, is more important than ever before if we want to make a better future for ourselves right now. To make a better future where our souls are no longer held down by gravity. <laughs>